Welcome back to another live stream. How is everyone doing? Let me have a sip of coffee first. Mm. Ah, I've just posted a new video this week. It was on Monday and it was about me doing a job, quite a challenging shoot for Kuala Lumpur Performing Arts uh, Center, CalPAC. And it was a live music performance where the audience uh, and the performance were moving together. There were no stage. It was dim light, the entire show, constant movement of the performance. There was dance. There was some action. And uh, it was quite a tough shoot because the light kept changing and I have to have enough shutter speed to freeze motion. So... I actually had to use ISO 12800 and I found that my Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II, let me just pull up the camera here, if I can bring it up here. I found that this camera actually performed really, really well. <laughs> so if you have not uh, seen that video that I've posted earlier this week, uh, do check it out later. This particular live stream is more like a continuation or a follow-up to that video that I did and I want to discuss a little bit further about whether Micro Four Thirds is still a good enough camera system or is it sufficient for us to, to deliver in a professional shooting environment. I want to touch about that in a broader sense, not just about that particular shoot. <laughs> Anyways, how is everyone doing? Let's uh, read some comments first. I see some people are already in the stream. Uh, one man Ben said, hello, hi, thanks for stopping by. <laughs> number six said, hey Robin, hey number six, how are you? Luke S said, hi Robin from Australia, hi Luke, nice to see you here again. Thank you guys for dropping by, it's always very, very happy for me to see all of you here. Oh, before I um, go further, I also want to make a note about this microphone setup. It is the same microphone I've been using for all my previous streams. And the only thing that I did different this time was I put a dead cat, or you call, what people call this, the windscreen, which I bought from a third party so, uh, source. This dead cat uh, filter was not designed for this microphone. And the reason I got this was just to play around with different setup, whether it is uh, good enough to prevent plosives when I put my mouth too close to the microphone. I, I have a pop filter, which is a more popular choice for professionals to use when they do podcasts or streaming, or even singers, right, when they put their mouth too close to the microphone to prevent plosives. But I found that the pop filter was, it was effective like 90% of the time. I still have some plosives. And during my tests uh, offline between this and the pop filter, I found that this was quite effective as well. Maybe a slightly more effective than the pop filter. And the reason I don't like the pop filter is because it has an attachment that goes all the way here. And I kept touching or bumping into that arm attachment, which would cause a loud boom, which is very, very annoying. So without the pop filter, I'm more free to move around without uh, doing some, without accidentally causing handling noise to the microphone. Let me know how I sound this time using this particular setup. Uh, it is, is it as good or as bad as what I remember previously? Let me know. YPE Bandung, Michael said, good evening from Thailand. Good evening, Michael. <laughs> All right, I do have a few things I want to cover uh, this particular evening on this live stream. But before I do that, uh, I do want to give you guys an update on what's happening with my life, at least in the past one week since the last stream that I did uh, last, if I'm not mistaken, last Friday. Or was it last Thursday? I can't remember. It was one week ago. Uh, I think it's probably Friday, Friday night. And in that stream, I said that, after the stream on Saturday morning, I was flying to Penang and I had a wedding reception to shoot. And that was the weekend. I spent uh, the weekend in Penang, which was about an hour flight away from Kuala Lumpur. Or if you drove, it'll be like five, five hours drive north 
uh, from Kuala Lumpur, and it was a very fun shoot. I get to to see some friends. Uh, I get to do a little bit of wedding photography again. I used to shoot a lot of weddings back in the day, but in the past four years or so, the last wedding I did was just before the pandemic or the lockdown craziness. Uh, and after that, I haven't done any weddings. Seriously, I did a little bit of portraits there and here, pre-wedding shots, but not uh, an actual day reception wedding. So this was one of the rare cases where I got uh, a job doing wedding and it was actually a friend. A shout out to Jesslyn and Kian. Thank you so much for having me. It was a really fun shoot. It was in the weekend and I came back on Monday uh, to Kuala Lumpur and I had an event to attend on Tuesday. Uh, that was the Xiaomi Malaysia's launch of the Xiaomi's latest smartphone, the Xiaomi 13T series. And the fun part about this launch was that my friend Kieran Long, who is uh, from Kuching, Borneo, and he is a Leica ambassador as well, he was hired to shoot with the pre-production sample of the Xiaomi 13T Pro smartphone. And that smartphone was co-engineered with Leica. So my friend Kieran being a Leica ambassador, shooting with a Xiaomi's phone with a Leica brand. So it's a no-brainer. And I'm so proud to see him there with his photographs being in prints. And him, uh, they, they were actually showing a video of him uh, behind the scenes of him in action capturing those shots. So it's very nice to see a friend from hometown uh, making it huge here in Kuala Lumpur, being involved in an international stage. And yeah, I pro hopefully he'll become a Xiaomi ambassador. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but he's doing some great things out there. And I'm really, really proud of you, Kieran, if you are watching this. Um, I'll pull out the link to my vlog. Yes, I have a vlog channel. Uh, this is my secondary YouTube channel where I put out videos that are not really connected to photography. It's more like the events that I attend, the friends that I hang out to, the food that I eat, or some travel vlogs there and here. Uh, it's just a, a, a mixture of random stuff that I vlog about. I don't just want to talk about photography all the time, but I keep my main channel here clean specifically for photography related topics, camera reviews, lenses, photography tips, my thoughts on photography or the industry. Of course, a lot of photo walks and POV street uh everything photography related is here but all my other stuff like my vlogs all my my other events that i go to i put it here so i'm gonna paste it in the chat section uh you can go to the this particular uh channel and you can see my vlog on that uh xiaomi's 13 t series launch which was actually just two days ago and with my friend Kieran there uh, doing his thing so yeah if you haven't subscribed to my second channel please go there and subscribe that will mean a whole world to me and just want to throw this out what else did I do uh, let me just pull this up oh yeah so I came back uh, so after the event of course I caught up with Kieran on, on Tuesday night and yesterday, I did a spontaneous trip to Genting Highlands. And if you don't know what or where Genting Highlands is, it is famous for a few things. And one of them is they have the only casino in Malaysia. I think, I'm not even sure if this fact is true, but for the longest time, if you want to go to a casino, that's where you go to, Genting Highlands. And it's about one hour drive from Kuala Lumpur. This on another state in Pahang. Uh, a friend asked me, hey Robin, you want to go out and chill with us? Uh, we want to just go to Gunting and maybe gamble a little bit and just have fun. So I thought, yeah, I've been so busy lately with camera reviews, with uh, doing my own videos, with shoots, uh, and I was really stressed out with some jobs a few weeks ago shooting a large scale festival. So I, I've been constantly on the run. My mind is all over the places. I have so many so many deadlines to to chase and so many photographs to deliver and on top of that i still regularly update my main channel with fresh videos every single week without fail right so for the past few months i've been on this uh, fight or flight mode that i thought wow i really need some time to just sit down and not do anything i thought what better way to, to do that than going to a casino and just gamble some money away? <laughs> 
and that's what I did uh, yesterday. So me and my friends, we, we drove to Gunting, uh, stay, stay over one night. And man, it was nice having that, uh, just that one to two days, not thinking about anything, you know, just, just hang out, chill, catch up and do a little bit of gambling. And man, it was really, really, really fun. And I'm back here. I just got back like a few hours ago. Uh, and then I went to the gym, you know, I, I got to keep in shape. And, you know, camera gears are really heavy these days, you know, like lenses are getting bigger and bigger and the cameras also not getting smaller. So I got to stay in shape. So I went to the gym and I'm back from the gym, had my dinner. And now I'm here doing this live stream, uh, talking to you guys. Let's read some comments. But before that, coffee, more coffee. And I don't know if you guys can see my awesome uh, Canon cup, Canon lens, L lens cup. Yeah, I have coffee here. Mm. Coffee is life. <laughs> Luke said, sounds great. Thanks, Luke, and thanks for dropping by. Michael says, amazing sound. Thank you. Paul91 Gattuso said, hi, Robin. Do you use polarized filter brand or filter you recommend? No, I don't use polarized filter, uh, but I do uh, recognize the importance or the necessity of a polarized filter in some situations. I should be investing in a filter because there are times where, let's say that I'm shooting into through a window with reflections or am I shooting water? Uh, if I want to get rid of the reflections, then the only way to do so is to have an actual polarized filter. So it can come in really handy. Brand that I will, if, if I were to buy, I'm, I'm not recommending this to you because uh, I've been a little bit out of touch with the world of filters. There are a lot of new brands out there. I haven't tried them. I have no experience. So I'm the last person qualified to comment on filters. But if I were to go out and buy a polarized filter for a job today to use right I will buy a Hoya I've always been using Hoya uh, currently I have a few ND filters neutral density filters that I use for video making some fixed ND filters like ND8 ND32 uh, and the latest one that I bought from them but by latest I mean like I bought it maybe two years ago, three years ago, <laughs> um, mainly for video making purposes, right? To cut the light so that I can get the one over 50th of a second uh, shutter angle cinematic look kind of thing. Anyway, uh, the latest one is a variable ND filter. I think it was a variable from two times to like 1000 times. I don't know. I don't even know the numbers anymore. I just put a filter in front of my lens, rotate the ring until enough light is being cut and I just start filming. So yeah, uh, I don't have a polarized filter. If I were to buy one, I would probably get Hoya. But look around and ask around other photographers if you have other friends who may be more knowledgeable than me. Right. Raz MD said, let's collaborate Robin once I'm in KL. Love your content. Ha, ah, I am not. Okay, here's the thing. People reach out to me all the time, all right? I get like 100 emails a day and it's, it's just crazy. And I have been receiving requests to collab like left, right, center, up, down. And if I start saying yes, it's not fair if I, let's say I collab with you, Raz. I would love to. I think it'll be awesome. But if I collab with you, then I turn down the other photographers or other YouTubers or anyone else, it will be just unfair and people will start to be unhappy. So for the sake of being fair and just not causing any problem, I am not collaborating with anyone at this point, except for the few friends that I've already made years ago, like Mati Sulanto, Peter's Field of Horse God. Like I've known Mati for, I don't know, 10 years now, coming to 10 years. Yeah, even before I started YouTube. So we are already friends. So it makes sense that we, we do a collaboration, but um, I am currently not really open to new collaborations. I am so sorry. I'm sure you are doing really well. So just keep doing whatever you are doing, all right? Zhao Yun Wong said, Hey, gods of <laughs> Olympus, oh, I'm system now. I am just a normal guy. Uh, yep. Torah with Styria said, Hello, Robin. Good day. Hey, Torah, how are you? Noon WLT said, hey there, Robin, how's it going? Hey, Noon, thanks for dropping by. Uh, really nice to see you here. One man band said, gambling is not clever. Of course, gambling is not clever. Uh, 
you need to have the right mindset when you go to gamble, right? If you think that you want to gamble to win money, if you want to gamble to, I don't know, to have some excitement in your life, or you think that you can get lucky and, and make a huge sum of money quickly, then of course, that is not clever. But if you go into a casino with the mindset of, I just want to chill, I just want to forget the world in a while, and I'm going to allocate certain funds, say, I don't know, here, 200 ringgit, uh, that will be equivalent to maybe 50 US dollars. And I'm going to use that money and play whatever games on a casino, blackjack, roulette, or the slot machines, whatever, for the entire day. Win or lose, no consequence. If I finish that 200 ringgit or the 50 US dollars, finish. I will not go further. So it's more like I'm paying for an entertainment. So I don't think in this case it is about being clever or not being clever. I just want to have fun. Like, dude, do you know how stressful it is making YouTube videos, you know, every single week without fail? Talking to the camera like a mad person? Like, give me some chance to just distress. And man, that two days, like yesterday and today, like going to the casino, we spent like, I don't know, 10, 12 hours in there doing whatever we did. It was so fun. Am I gonna do this often? No. Am I gonna go, go back there to the casino? Yes. Maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. Hang out with some friends. It is an innocent fun. You just need some self-control. If you have gambling problem, you will end up in trouble even without going to the casino anyways. <laughs> Pixel Peter said, what it boils down to, camera sensor size doesn't really matter, subject light and all that is much more important. I, yes, that's true. Understanding how to optimize the camera using whatever cam uh, sensor size there is. Uh, but I gotta say though, if you say sensor size doesn't really matter, that's also not true. Like, I wouldn't do a job or a wedding with a smartphone because I know that the sensor size is just too small. Not because the smartphone is not fast enough, not because the smartphone is not good enough. It's just that I know that because the sensor size is too small, that I can't get the certain look that I need for my clients. So yeah, I have to disagree here. Sensor size does matter. And the smallest I will go to will be micro four thirds. At one time, I was hoping that the one inch sensor will be good enough but i've tried several one inch sensor cameras the sony rx100 series the panasonic lx5 i think no that was that's 10 and some canon g series right i forgot which g7x uh, mark 2 and 3 i've tried these cameras and to be honest the one inch sensor is just not good enough uh, compared to micro four thirds and of course if you go on and on full frame will be better aps will be better but at this point my cap or like the minimum for me to use would be micro four thirds exploring with rotten fish hi robin hey how are you john <laughs> John says, I don't have enough video shots from Hong Kong. Can't complete the video. Oh, come on, man. Let's, let's hang out. Let's go to KL somewhere and do a photo walk or something. And let's just complete that video, man. Come on. It'll be fun. Let me know. Hit me up whenever you're free or whenever you want to do a photo walk. Between you and me, John, I think you are, you, you are the busier person, right? Seems like you always have something on in the weekend. You're traveling to like Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, or you have like weddings in Langkawi or something. I'm usually well, the past weekend I was in Penang, but I'm usually the one in Kuala Lumpur. So, uh, John, let me know uh, whenever you want to do the photo walk together. And guys, uh, if you don't know who John Law is, John Law is, uh, is a friend and he's a professional wedding photographer based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And he shoots amazing wedding photographs. He is like the best wedding photographer that I know in person and I've learned so much for, from him. I'm going to pull up John's YouTube channel. Uh, just give me a moment and you guys can subscribe to him. Let's see if I can pull this up. Yep, that's it. I'm going to copy his channel. I'm going to paste on the chat. There you go. And there. That's John Law's channel. Basically, it's just youtube.com slash John Law. 
check his YouTube channel out. Uh, he has plenty of amazing videos. Uh, I do appear in some of his videos and I think that he's really talented in terms of video editing skills. He's like way better than me. <laughs> he's, he dares to experiment with different techniques. Uh, he, he dares to try different things, whereas I'm just the one playing safe and I always take the more efficient or lazy way out. So guys, uh, go to John's channel, give him a subscribe and check him out. Lumiere Obscure said, Good evening, Robin. Nice to see you live here. Thanks, Lumiere. I'm very happy to be live here. One man Ben said, Okay, that's okay then. <laughs> no worries. A little bit of fun is, is, is not harmful, right? Richard Willander said, Hi, Robin. Do you ever shoot with a CCTV lens on your Olympus camera? Yes, I have. That was maybe more than 10 years ago now when I was using the Olympus EPL-1 and I've tried some CCTV lens on the original EM-5 and not a fan, not a fan. I think the results are quite horrendous. Uh, I don't like all this. I know it has character. A lot of people say that the swirly bokeh, the softness, the, the bloom and all those imperfections make the, the photograph speci special, right? But uh, nah, it's just too, too, too many imperfections, too many problems. Vlad, in, now, I, Vlad Ivanovich said, good morning. Love your channel and the energy your videos have. One question, besides OM system, what other interchangeable lens system would you trust in a windy desert with very fine sand? I think anything top tier from Canon and Nikon will be okay. Like uh, say, for example, a Canon 1D series cameras or a Nikon D, like D5, D6, those really top tier flagship uh, from Canon and Nikon. These cameras are built like a tank and in terms of ceiling, they are also very, very, very well constructed. Right, let me just check something quickly. Right, Lent Fari said, how much does size and weight matter to you personally? It is a huge aspect in the performance cost equation for me. Size and weight matters a lot. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later uh, in my discussion on is Micro Four Thirds good enough? It is one of the key points that I'm going to talk about. So if you can stay on just a little bit further, I will definitely dive deeper into this question of yours. Yeah, Land Ferry. So uh, I beg for your patience. <laughs> Number six says, uh, question, please relate how you shot that dance performance. You told me you changed ISO manually. In the video, you said fast shutter speed was needed to catch the dancer's emotion. How did you do it? So when I see the dancers move quickly, uh, I was shooting in shutter speed, either shutter speed parity or aperture parity. It doesn't matter. I changed this uh, on the go, depending on situations. I think in this situation, I was using aperture parity because I just want to force the aperture to the widest anyway. I don't want the F number to, to move around. So I fixed the aperture at F1.8. I was using, say, the Olympus 45 F1.8, right? And I've, the aperture is the brightest so that I can gather as much light as possible. And... I will have to then change the ISO manually so that I can get the shutter speed that I need. So for the dance moves uh, to be safe, I will need about 1 over 1,000 of a second. If it's really fast dance, if it's a slow movement, maybe 1 over 500 is enough. So I start with 1 over 500, 1 over 1,000, then I see how much ISO that I need until I get the shot of the dance performance frozen uh, in action. I hope that makes sense. I fixed the aperture at 1.8 and then I change the ISO as necessary as I keep going up and up. ISO 3200, 6400. If necessary, I go to 2800 until the shutter speed is fast enough to freeze motion. Uh, slow dance, one over 500, fast moving dance. There's like spinning and then jumping and everything. Then I will need like one over 1000. I hope that answers your question. Pixel Peter said, I was generally speaking given the title of this here threat. <laughs> no worries. Raz MD said, Well, you ever reviewed uh, EP7? I think you're referring to uh, the pen camera. The camera is not available here. I can't find it. So the EP7, the pen EP7, was a limited release in some countries. I don't know, like, 
I don't even know which country, maybe in the US or some parts of the Europe, uh, in Japan. It was not released anywhere in Asia. I can't find it in Malaysia. You cannot find it in Singapore. Is it even available in the US? I'm not even sure. Uh, I, I know it's available in some parts of Europe, uh, definitely in Japan. Uh, but it's like majority part of the world, like 80% of the other countries outside of Japan or those a few European countries, you can't find EP7. Not that I don't want to review it, like the local distributor that carries the OM Digital Solutions here, they don't even have the camera. Like, how do you expect me to source the camera, right? <laughs> Lumiere of Scare said, Mind me asking if you consider using speed boosters in order to overcome micro filters limitations? And if not, what should the manufacturers aim for to improve them? No, I don't want to attach any attachments before the lens. Having the lens directly attached to the camera, which is natively built for the camera, such as Micro Four Thirds native mount lenses, these are optimized not just for autofocus speed and reliability, but also in terms of image quality, in terms of how the light hits the sensor, the distance, everything is already calculated, optimized, fully, fully optimized for the use of micro four thirds sensor. I don't trust these speed, speed boosters. I know that it has some trick to make the lens wider, to have like from f1.8, it can become f1.2, blah, 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 yes. But I just don't care. And adapting lenses from say full frame lenses or other lenses doesn't make sense to me because these lenses are usually very large and they are also they have maybe older motors which will work slower than native micro four thirds lenses. They don't work for me. Angelo Play for one set. Do you use vintage lenses such as Konica, Minota, Nikon F, Canon FD? What do you think of the use of these lenses? No, because these lenses do not have autofocus. No autofocus, no go for Robin. Why autofocus is important for me? Because everything that I shoot. Inside macro, okay, inside macro may be an exception because some insects don't move. Uh, everything that I shoot, street photography, uh, live music, portraits, humans move, right? Anything, stage events, uh, dance, or whatever, right? Everything that I shoot, they move. And because they move, I just can't constantly manual focus. It is so difficult. And it's just, when I take a photograph, I want to focus on the composition. I want to focus on the lighting. I want to focus on the story that I'm telling. I want to capture the moment. I want to, to, to time myself properly and really put on my effort and energy and focus on getting that decisive moment and to tell a compelling story and how to capture and convey emotions successfully. Having to manual focus all the time is just an unnecessary distraction and I believe that we should do away with manual focus lenses because autofocus lenses these days are so cheap, especially if you buy in used market. I would rather use a kit lens than a manual focus lens, <laughs> if that makes sense. All right, uh, I want to dive into a topic now. The one that we're supposed to talk about today is Micro Four Thirds good enough? <laughs> All right. As I've mentioned before, this particular stream or the discussion of the topic is a continuation of my video that I did about shooting with very high ISO in a very challenging job. It was a live music performance, uh, challenging light that I had to use ISO 12800. In that video, I demonstrated that this uh, Olympus EM1 Mark II that I have is definitely more than enough to get the job done. All right, I still love this camera. It's my main workhorse. I think that Micro Four Thirds is uh, still a capable system. And that's what I mentioned in that particular video. Now, this is a follow-up or a continuation to that discussion, not just about that challenging lighting uh, shoot job, but also in a more broader sense. Now, before I dive into specific topics of why Micro Four Thirds is good enough, I want to touch on why Micro Four Thirds is important in the camera industry. If you guys don't realize, Micro Four Thirds was the first ever mirrorless system. It was Micro Four Thirds that introduced mirrorless concept 
into the camera industry. Before Micro Four Thirds, there was DSLR. DSLR was dominant. And if you want to get a professional camera or if you are enthusiast, you want to do more from a compact point and shoot camera, then you want to look into a DSLR system because DSLR cameras, you can, inter you can change lenses. You can shoot with wide angle, you can shoot with macro, you can shoot with prime lenses, you can shoot with telephoto lenses and do different things with your camera, right? So DSLR is like the default a uh, professional system and whoever has a DSLR, they are automatically seen as a pro photographer. This was back in the day. And then there came the Micro Four Thirds Alliance. I think originally the main players are Olympus, Panasonic, I think Sigma was in the Alliance, Kodak, Leica, and a few others, uh, which I, I can't remember all of them, but uh, the key players are Olympus and Panasonic. So in the year 2008, towards the end of 2008, Panasonic launched the first ever Micro Four Thirds camera, the first ever mirrorless camera in the world, which was the Panasonic Lumix G1. Subsequently, a few months later, in the year 2009, Olympus launched the first Micro Four Thirds camera, which was the second mirrorless camera in the world, which was the Olympus Pan EP1. Now, this first Micro Four Thirds cameras, the G1 from Panasonic and EP1 from Olympus, they were very, very significant in the history of camera making or the imaging industry because these were the first cameras to get rid of the DSR design. They took out the mirror box, they took out the Penta Prism, so there is no optical viewfinder, and yet, they maintain the ability to change lens, which was the main advantage of using a DSLR. So the main advantage of a DSLR is you can change the lens, bigger sensor for you know better dynamic range and better high ISO performance, better resolution, right? Because the sensor is big, you can change lens, you can do a lot. So they maintain the best things from DSLR and they remove the mirror box, they remove the penta prism, hence it is called mirrorless. So because it was micro four thirds, that actually push the industry towards the direction of mirrorless. Micro Four Thirds was the pioneer. They were the first to make this happen. They had the advantage of years and years and years of experience to make a mature, developed system. And even today, I still consider Micro Four Thirds as the most developed, most complete, and most mature mirrorless system. They were the first they were at the forefront, they were the first to champion the concept of mirrorless, moving away from DSLR, they were the first to say, hey, let's make these cameras smaller, and yet, we don't sacrifice quality, we don't sacrifice the versatility, the advantage of being able to change lenses, and yet, moving forward, we're adding a few more important advantages such as image stabilization, what you see is what you get when you look at the electronic viewfinder or the LCD screen, which you can't do with DSLR, and they drastically improve the burst shooting. You know, you can burst 10, 20 frames, 60 frames per second because if you use DSLR, there's limitation of the mirror movement that you can't physically move the mirror like 100 frames per second, right? So once you get rid of the mirror box, you can use crazy speeds to shoot and there's just so much more improvements and because due of the use of electronic shutter, there's a lot of other things like computational photography that came into play that made photography or the advancement of photography a lot more possible. So the photography took a leap you know, it, it was like a huge jump in terms of techn technological advancement because photography moved towards the mirrorless direction from DSLR, moved to mirrorless, and Micro Four Thirds was the first to convince the world that it is possible. So to me, Micro Four Thirds will always be an important player when it comes to camera systems. They prove that mirrorless is possible and they demonstrated that the mirrorless is a capable professional system. Here is why. Let me see. Ah, this is the EM1. This is the original EM1. I don't know if you can see this. It's a little bit dark. All right. This is the original EM1. When Olympus launched this in the year 2013, the OMD EM1, the second OMD camera from Olympus, the EM1, they created a blueprint 
for all other manufacturers to follow on what a professional pro-grade mirrorless camera should be. It, is, it has a DSLR style grip, which is very beefy. You can handle the camera comfortably. It is well built. The body is magnesium alloy body. It is weather sealed, splash, dust, and uh, freeze resistant. It has electronic viewfinder, which is large and comfortable to view. You have the advantage of what you see is what you get. It handles like a DSLR because you have the front and back dial. right? You can change shutter speed and aperture uh, quickly from the, the dial. And the camera has a retro look. It mirrors the OM-1 camera from Olympus, which was their own original OM digital, no, sorry, OM film <laughs> camera, right? So it has the style, it has powerful image stabilization, it has a lot of tricks, and the autofocus was really fast. So because of this EM-1, Olympus set a path for everyone to follow. Sony, Fuji, you know, subsequently you look at the cameras, the DNA in the cameras, it is very similar to what Olympus did in the EM1. So why I'm saying this, why I'm going back into history, because a lot of people are today, they say, oh, you know, today we have so many cameras. That's true. Today we have like Canon mirrorless R system. We have like Nikon Z system, right? Nikon has just launched the ZF, the retro looking full frame camera, which is really small, looks really cool and also very capable as well, really some interesting specifications. And then Fuji has really capable SH series cameras, uh, you know, Sony, of course, has been a strong player in the industry. We are not lack of options. Even there are so many mirrorless cameras out there today. But all these mirrorless cameras are only possible because Olympus and Panasonic or the Micro Photo System dare to gamble and push and challenge the norm. And they went mirrorless first with their Micro Four Thirds cameras. And over the years, they launched different lenses, different cameras. And Olympus was successful in the EM1 series cameras to prove that these cameras are capable, professional, steals camera system, right? And Panasonic went on to do something else. The GH2 and the GH3, of course, the GH series cameras subsequently became like a videographer's tool. Cinema cinematographers use them to shoot documentaries, to shoot short films, and they make splashes. And these uh, cinematographers, they actually win awards using uh, filming with Panasonic cameras. So we have camera, micro four thirds camera system from Panasonic, which is video centric in the professional video world. And we have professional camera system from Olympus or currently it's the one digital solutions, which they, they do so well in the professional shooting environment. And this is still very true until today, because if this was true just five, six, seven years ago, it still continues to be true today. There are some advancements there and here. There are some missteps there and here. There's some issues or there are some bumps along the road of in terms of product development. We don't get everything that we want or we need from both Olympus, Panasonic, and currently the OM Digital Solutions. But their cameras have always, always been capable all this time. That is a very, very important point. <laughs> All right, I, before I continue on uh, why I think Micro Four Thirds is uh, capable or why it's important in the industry, let's look at some comments. All right, Kari Pereira said, I have an EP7 camera and it's amazing. She made me fall in love for Micro Four Thirds cameras again. Really great camera. Where are you at, Kari? It is not, EP7 is not on sale in Malaysia. Mr. Malo said, Micro Four Thirds is good enough to make me want to visit Malaysia. Keep up the good work, Robin. Thank you so much, Mr. Malo. I'm going to drink some coffee. Ah, let's see. So, stacks. Wow, we have 100 concurrent viewers. Where do you guys come from? <laughs> Hello, 100 people from all over the world. Uh, if you're here, please say hi. I will respond to every single comment as I go along. ATF said, hello from California. Is Micro Four Thirds owned by Panasonic and Olympus? What would it take to see a Nikon, Canon, or Sony Micro Four Thirds camera? Micro Four Thirds is an open source format, if I'm not wrong. It is not owned by Olympus and Panasonic, but Olympus and Panasonic are the largest players in the Micro Four Thirds world. 
if that makes sense. We do get lenses from Yongnuo, uh, Sigma. We also have cameras from uh, Yongnuo. We have camera from Xiaomi as well, or Xiaoyi. Uh, we have lenses from Samyang. We have lenses from uh, Seven Artisans, TT Artisans. They also make lenses for a micro filter mount or Lawa. So it's pretty much an open standard uh, or everyone can just come in and use the mount. Uh, I don't think it's proprietary or I don't think it's like Canon who, who is very hesitant on letting other people make lenses for or third party lenses for the camera mount system. Exploring with Rotten Fish said, I'm still using GH5 and love it so much and I enjoy even in low light, low shutter speed, but the results so sharp. Thanks for the image stabilization. That's working great. I know, right? Image stabilization is really incredible these days. Read uh, Ram Harak said, Hey Robin, much love from Teeny Dad. Your reviews got me into the Olympus OMD system and I've had no regrets since. Thank you so much for letting me know. And uh, I hope you enjoy shooting with it um, and whatever cameras that you use, uh, please go out and take more photographs. One man band said, I have the G3 and the GM1. They are great. GM1, I have a GM1 here somewhere. This is a GM1. And I agree with you. It is great. It's such a great camera. Look at how tiny it is. All right. I have an Olympus too, but I don't use it. Why? Why don't you use Olympus? Because it's too big. <laughs> well, Borg MS said, I will only use a manual lens if it's compact. Uh, f stop is fast and has good quality control for steel portraits like the 50F 0.95 Leica. Oh, come on. You got to bring out that Leica lens, of course. <laughs> I think the reason why people use manual lenses or the old vintage lenses is because they are so cheap, right? And that. 50 F0.95 Leica, I can like buy a small house here or a car. Definitely a really good car here. <laughs> go to go to Fraff said, hello, Mr. Wong. Hey, how are you? Exploring with Rotten Fish said, for me, micro filter sensor is not crop sensor. Any sensor size is depending on type of lens and circle image for micro filters. Specific lens is exactly for small sensor like micro filter sensor. That's why micro filter lens is short body. It's true. I agree that micro filter is not supposed to be called a cropped body. And the lenses should not have crop factor. But I guess that's what they reference because there has to be a standard format, right? If everyone is using like your 12 millimeters is my 24 and another person's 36, it's just too confusing. So to standardize everything so that we understand if you talk about 12, I know what your 12 is with certain crop factor uh, so that everyone is on the same page and can understand each other. I guess a standard is necessary such as the 35 millimeters full frame format. Anything that's not full frame is crop, unfortunately. I, but I agree with you, micro filters is not crop. Hey Santix, how are you? Nice to see you here. Santix said, if micro filters can come up with a rev revolutionary sensor, BSI stacked, pixel binning, and multi-native ISO for greater dynamic range. Well, the OM1 is a BSI stacked image sensor, and it has pixel binning. I think uh, it has quad sensor bin into one. And unfortunately, there is no greater dynamic range to be observed there. The image quality is about the same as what we get from the previous non-BSI stacked sensor. And a multi-native ISO, we already have that in a Panasonic GH6. And uh, I'm not sure if the G9 has the multi-native ISO. I haven't looked at the specifications uh, very closely, but uh, the GH6, it has dual native ISO. Vlad Ivanovich said, uh, so I guess instead of asking which sensor size is better, the better question is what full frame or even medium format or APS-C camera system would you use where Micro Four Thirds doesn't excel? It depends on the needs, hey. Uh, like for example, if I get a client or I get to partner with an agency, I know that I'm going to get a stream of photography jobs that requires me to shoot crazy high megapixels and the clients will demand say 100 megapixels from my camera then of course i will go to medium format like Hasselblad or phase one or fuji gfx system right uh if megapixels or resolution is 
is the concern, then medium format is the way to go. Uh, I see no reason using APS-C because APS-C and Micro Four Thirds, the difference is just negligible. I've tried APS-C cameras like from Fuji, from Sony, from Canon. I can't even see the difference in image quality. And sometimes I think that the quality from my Micro Four Thirds sensor, although it's slightly smaller, it looks better. You know, and even if there are some improvements, maybe the ISO is slightly better, like half a stop, or maybe the dynamic range is slightly better. I don't see it. So because of that, Micro Four Thirds is already so good. And that APS-C is just, to me, it's just redundant, right? Full frame, yes. Uh, let's say that I have a client who will ask me to shoot a theater show uh, that's kind of lit. <laughs> or in an environment, in a moonlit environment, outdoor by the beach, I have to shoot like a performance, like no additional light whatsoever, right? I have to use like ISO 1 million. Of course, I would get a full frame, right? So it all depends on the need. And I wouldn't purposely buy a camera with that capability just because it can do it, right? Let's say that you can shoot ISO 1 million, moon, you can turn the moonlight scene into daylight, you know, and see everything clearly. I don't shoot, I don't go to the beach. The beach here is like two hours away from Kuala Lumpur. And I don't find myself in that situation. So because I don't encounter those situations enough, then investing in those kind of tools where I don't even use it is a little bit pointless, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I hope that answers your question, uh, Vlad. Santix said, uh, as even mobile phone sensors are being highly developing, I disagree. I look at the mobile, mobile sensors, mobile phone sensors, like they claim to have like 200 megapixels, 100 megapixels, pixel binning there and here, but seriously, if you look at the image quality, they are seriously crap. I'd rather use like a 10 years old image sensor from like EP1 or even a DSLR, like Nikon D80, for example, with only 12 megapixels, and the images look so much better that any smartphones you can find today. And I'll tell you, I'd rather use a six megapixels Nikon D50, which I bought for 150 ringgit. The images come out looking better than any smartphone cameras out there today. Maxim Brasad said, uh, Canada, hey, how are you? Goturov said, uh, Germany, hi, nice to see you. Uh, that explains, I think you're the one that got the EP7, right? Or was it someone else? Scott P said, Atlanta, all right. I think you guys are just mentioning the countries where you're from because it's not I was mentioning. Wow, where are you guys from? Because we still have like 100 people here. That's incredible. John Lowe said, we need a new resolution sensor. We need a one-to-one -one, uh, aspect ratio sensor to cater both portrait and landscape ratios. And of course, a square ratio. Hey, the one-to-one -one square sensor is a great idea so that you don't lose out when you crop, whether it's a portrait orientation or... Uh, or the normal landscape orientation, right? And I think that uh, we can even have a multi aspect ratio, like the native full sensor ratio is one to one. And then we can choose which aspect ratio to, to crop into so that the raw file doesn't have to be so huge, right? Let's say if it's a one to one sensor and your, your raw uh, capture will be, let's say 100 megapixels for example. So if you crop it down to, say, the standard 3.2 uh, aspect ratio for the you know current full-frame cameras, then maybe you can reduce from 100 megapixels to maybe just 60 megapixels, you know, rather than you have 100 megapixels files all the time. If you crop it further, say 16.9, because some people do shoot cinematic 16.9, maybe you can only capture like a 50 megapixels raw file. I think that will be a great option. It's not like you're losing anything because you have decided that, okay, for this shoot, I'm not going to shoot anything... Uh, square or portrait i'm just going to shoot the normal landscape shots uh landscape orientation then i just instead of shooting like 100 megapixels all the time i can get away with just 50 megapixels i think that makes more sense and then oh i need to take some uh portrait shots for instagram or for stories right then uh, i don't have to rotate the camera the sensor will just automatically adjust based on just a press of a button and you can get that portrait orientation without even losing any resolution because it's square i think that's genius john Kajia Kopp said, hello Robin, hello all from Germany. Hi, how are you? Lumia Obscura said, Algeria, hey. Wow, you guys are from everywhere. Mike Van Bunt said, I'm in Wisconsin in USA. Hi. Wow, Pixar Peter said, Netherlands. Hello. John Rayner said, hi from Cape Town, South Africa. EM10 Mark II user and loving it. That is a great camera. Andrew Galloway said, from Ontario, Canada. Yeah. Hey. Hey, Andrew, how are you? Icarus Chun said, hello from Hong Kong. Hi, Icarus. 
thanks for dropping by. And Ikra says, thank you for the great videos always. My pleasure to share whatever I can. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate your visits. Don and Large said, hello, Robin from Georgia, USA. I continue to learn from you. Appreciate all of your efforts. Thank you so much. My pleasure to share as much as I can. And Trick all said, how do you all from Washington, DC? Hey, and Trick, how are you? Number six says, like, like, like. Thanks for the reminder, man. Appreciate it. Andre Roberts said, Hi from Arizona. I have the OMD EM5 Mark III. Love the camera. Had a first gen EM5. I shoot a lot of video with it. Have a few lenses you recommend. Love it. Best investments I've made as a hobby. EM5 Mark III is such a beast for video. Like, I shoot most of my videos with EM5 Mark III. And I use it for my vlogs as well. Such a small camera, so easy to carry around. I think it is, like, to me currently, one of the best options for vlogging the only thing that stopped me from saying the best ever is because we all know that olympus or on digital solutions when it comes to video specifications is a little bit behind competition like the em5 mark 3 it doesn't have 4k 60 you know everyone is having 4k 120 now and they have open gate or they have better codec like 10-bit video whereas the em5 mark 3 we are still stuck at 8-bit video and you know it's just just a lot of things that is just missing and a little bit behind if you compare with video specifications or what the competition say from panasonic or sony can do but other than that image stabilizer on the EM5 Mark III in terms of uh, the, even just the normal 4K video file. Uh, overall, what the, the, that camera can do is just simply amazing. And the autofocus as well is really, really incredibly reliable. Well, Borg MS said, micro four third lenses are compact and even equivalent lenses from APS-C are still quite big. Micro four thirds has lots of good lens selections and the lenses were the main draw for me compared to APS-C and full frame. I agree. Uh, the lens selection maturity is one of the strengths of micro four thirds, which I will talk about a little bit later. Like we are not lack of lens choices for micro four thirds these days. Russ MD said, do you think there will be a PanF successor? I think the earlier versions of micro four thirds cameras were beautifully designed. The the reason ones are all big and chunky. The PanF was a failure. I'm just going to be honest. It didn't do as well as Olympus predicted in terms of sales numbers. That's why we don't get a PanF Mark II from Olympus. So currently, OM Digital Solutions is a different company. Although they continue making products for Micro Four Thirds, continuing the Olympus legacy. But if they were to get, to make a PanF successor, say a PanF Mark II, then they have to figure out a way to sell the camera successfully. You can't just use the same formula and expect the camera to sell because if it failed once, it will fail again. No matter how many people say they like the retro design, they love the PanF, but if nobody buys the camera, if not, not nobody, if not enough people buy the camera, then OM Digital Solutions cannot justify spending the R&D effort, spending the manufacturing costs to make the camera and just lose money. That's not the right way of making business. Dean Robert Noble said, Hey Robin, love Micro Four Thirds. Bought the original EP1 when it came out. While I have viewed away from time to time, I still have the Olympus cameras. The EM5 Mark III is awesome, but I love using older bodies too. Yes, the EP1 is so awesome. It's such a vintage camera now. And the EM5 Mark III is still one of the greatest all-rounder Micro Four Thirds camera that I always recommend to anyone who wants to start with Micro Four Thirds. Dean Robert Noble said, just bought an old GX1 Lumix and rocks for such an old camera. I've been looking for some old Lumix cameras as well, just to go out, do some shoots uh, on the streets and maybe some POV action. I think that'll be really cool. But I haven't found one that is uh, at a good price and a good condition, so I'm still looking around in the used market in Malaysia. Len Faris said, can you make some prime lens pocket camera recommendation recommendations? Well, it depends on what you want to use. Hey, the prime lenses are really tiny. We have like everything from 9, 12, 14. We have 15, 16. We have 17. We have 20. We have 25. We have 30. We have 42.5. We have 45. We have 60. We have 75. It's like more than 10 prime lenses already, native micro photos mount. So which one to recommend? I can't just throw it out to you because I don't know what you're shooting. I don't know your preferences or the, your style. Like we're all different. Like I'm a 15 millimeters person, so I'll definitely get a, whether a Panasonic 25 f1.7 or an Olympus 25 f1.8. But some people don't like 15 millimeters. They prefer 35. Then they'll go to say an Olympus 17. And some people prefer to 
shoot wider, they want a, a 28 equivalent, so they go for Panasonic 14. So it all comes down to your own preferences. So ask yourself what kind of photography that you do and what is the suitable focal length that is uh, suited for your photography. And after you've been shooting for a while, then which focal length is your preference? Santik said, what I meant is mobile phone sensors, more competitive and more R&D. Uh, Samsung, Sony, then micro photo sensor makers. Probably only Panasonic and Sony in the micro photo sensor market. Yeah, but still, I haven't seen anything from mobile phones that actually blow my mind away, <laughs> just to be honest here. Icarus Chung said, do you think AI features like object recognition are important to modern camera? Seems they are the selling point of new camera recently. I think they are. I think we'll get to a point where you just have to compose and make sure your subject is in frame and you just let the camera figure out which particular subject to be in focus. Say that you are detecting a cat or a bird or a human, the camera will find it and make sure it stays in focus. That takes away the step to move the focusing point or half press the shutter button, all this. And the less to do during shooting, the more that the photographer can concentrate on the story that the photographer is telling, on the moment and the emotion that he's conveying. Or other things like composition, lighting, which are also very important to create a great photograph. So these are tools in terms of technological advancement that they do make a difference in helping the photographer to be more efficient so they can be faster in reacting to a certain situation. So being faster it also means that they can be more uh, capable in capturing critical moments, right? So any advancement of technology such as the subject recognition in terms of AI technology, I think it really helps and opens up the world of photography. Rebirth2526 said, hey, I agree with one-to-one uh, -one square sensor, Instagram ready. I know, right? Jose Miguel Alonso Alonso said, OM1 versus G9 Mark II. I cannot say anything now because I don't have the G9 Mark II but there are several videos online that already point to oh uh, there are some YouTubers or photographers who have both the cameras and they have made the analysis and the comparisons so feel free to look around the internet I don't have the G9 Mark II so it's also not fair for me for me to make any comments at this at this point rebirth 25 26 said G9 II just arrived in my country wish you could try it I don't think it will arrive in my country anytime soon. I haven't seen any pre-ordering page set up anywhere. I checked the Panasonic Malaysia's page almost every day. I don't see any events or any indication that the G9 Mark II is going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> Alex Shen said, I'm struggling with EMI Mark II or Mark III. I choose to because you do. Uh, either one is good. I don't think you'll regret getting any one of them. Uh, EMI Mark III has more advanced autofocus for face facial tracking and the video features is slightly more advanced. But uh, if you're not into video, I think EMI Mark II is still a great camera. I am still using EMI Mark II as my main camera. So this is my EMI Mark II here. If you can see the camera, get it in focus, All right? I still think Yamaha Mark II is a great, great, great camera today. And I still shoot with this, like, for my jobs, my main jobs, paid jobs, uh, for the past, like, 20 or 30 jobs, I've been using the EM1 Mark II. I think, still think it's a super, super capable camera. All right. Rob Villandia said, Hi, Robin. I have an OM1 Mark II. I think it's EM1 Mark II. Are there any lenses that can handle and take good Milky Way photographs? I, well, depends on what, how I okay first of all I don't shoot Milky Way but uh, I would think that the prerequisites for shooting a great Milky Way photograph is to have a wide angle with bright aperture and the one lens that comes in mind would be the Panasonic 9 f1.7 you can check this out I think uh, I don't know if you can get any focus 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 Right, so this is a Panasonic 9mm uh, f1.7. It's not too large and it's not too expensive as well. And it takes fantastic images. And I love this lens. Right. Let's continue on a few more comments before I go back to my discussion. HKM5757 says, Hi from Arustria. Hello. Lumiere Obscure said, In my opinion, the real challenge of future micro focus camera is to find a way around having higher megapixels in the sensors while producing sharp lenses to make the best out of them. I think the lenses are ready for high resolution. The lens is not a problem. Uh, Olympus, or currently the OM Digital Solutions, they are the optics expert. And Panasonic, they are partnering with Leica. 
So in terms of lens making, I don't think it is an issue. I think the lenses can handle 50, 80 megapixels, no problem. But if you're saying like 100, 200 megapixels, I may not dare to go there. And the reason why I say 80 megapixels is no problem because we already have 80 megapixels high resolution shots from both Olympus and Panasonic cameras. And those high res shots from this uh, resolve by the lenses, they look amazing. So if this lens, can resolve 80 megapixels. I know it's not the same as the sensor because you still need to use like the the pixel shift te uh, technique to move the pixel around just so that you can get more pixels in the shot. But still, it proves that the lenses are more than capable for that task to resolve 80 megapixels at least. But if you're talking about 100, 200, then yeah, I may not go there just yet. Maybe we need like a new optics design. Thomas Tian said, best regards from Slovakia, Lumix G80 and G9 user here, both amazing cameras. While well, Menben said, I live in Poland. Hey! Andrew Galloway said, Olympus OM system need more lenses with IS Sync. Panasonic has implemented this very well. I beg to disagree. The IS Sync only benefits longer lenses, and the longer lenses from Olympus or OM Digital Solutions, they have IS Sync. Right, And wider lenses, say even the 12 to 40 or even the 75, if you have tried the Olympus 75 uh, on any of the bodies with image stabilization, say the EM5 Mark III, EM1 Mark III, it is more than good enough. I know that the Sync IS will benefit maybe a little bit more, but that's additional cost bulk that I don't think is necessary. If you have seen, if you really try how capable, like you really, really push the camera and lens in low light situation, like you slow down the shutter speed, you can handhold incredibly slow shutter speeds. They realize that, yeah, maybe the Sync IS is not necessary. The Sync IS will definitely benefit lenses like 300 f4, uh, 150 to 400. Uh, these super long lenses at the tele end, that's too far away from the sensor. That's why the sensor, the image stabilization that's inside the body cannot help with the movement of the lens elements that is situated far away from the camera body. It's just physics. So having the image stabilization mechanism on the lens itself at the other end will definitely help to balance the movement of the lens and the body. Other than that, any of the small lenses, the body does great job. It's more than good enough. I've verified this though in a lot of my videos talking about image stabilization. Peter Lasota, is that the way I pronounce your name? Peter, I love micro four thirds for its size. I want to take a camera and small primes with me to take pictures, economy flights, instead of having some dope full frame that stays home. The rest is skill. That's true, hey. When you travel, you definitely want smaller cameras like this, right? Really small, compact cameras, like easy to put in a small bag uh, to carry around without feeling like it is a burden or without the bulky, the size or the weight, right? Something small you can just chuck around easily. I agree with you. Vladimir said, uh, do you know why Micro Four Thirds cameras does not bring 14 bits raw files? Thanks for your work. Because it cannot fill the entire 14 bits container. I think uh, 12 bits is more than good enough in terms of information. I don't see the advantage of 14 bit. Uh, when I look at the colors that I've edited from full frame cameras with 14 bit raw, they just don't give me the same info. I mean, it is good, don't get me wrong, but I don't see like it has a huge amount of difference that I feel like my Micro Four Thirds 12-bit roll is inferior. The 12-bit roll is already good enough. And yes, the full-frame camera to stretch the full-frame format because the pixels are larger, so you can get the 14-bits roll, right? But I just don't see the difference. So it's not a big deal if you ask me. Len Ferry said, I did some research for a uni statistics project and found that in recent years, the number of portraits to landscape format pictures increased drastically. Are phones affecting us? Yes, it does. The way people take photos is like, they hold a phone in a portrait orientation like that, and it just snap, 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 snap away, right? So people don't um, use the landscape orientation anymore if they are using phone. Our Paco film said, Olympus 100 to 400 does not have Sync IS and that lens should for the price. I disagree. If they add in the Sync IS, it'll cost maybe 20% more. People underestimate the cost of image stabilization. They think that, ah, just put the image stabilization and it will work. The image stabilization, do you know how it works? It actually moves the glass. If it's in the lens, it moves the glass. And the glass, in that 
hundred to four hundred lenses. Do you know how big the glass is? To be able to move such a large size glass, to have that precision that reads from the gyro of the movement and fit with the processor to quickly react to counter the movement. Let's say your hand moves this side, then it'll counter to this side. If you move up, then you'll push it down. To have that instant feedback and to have that move, to, to be able to move such a last, large piece of glass, it costs money. It's not, I just want this. I wasn't no. I would rather have it, the current image stabilization that's already in the lens. It works just as well. I've used 100 to 400 to great degree of success. I get sharp results. I understand, yes, the Sync IS will be so much better. I'm not complaining. But you got to admit, 100 to 400 is not a pro lens. The price is not a pro lens. If you want to look at what, how much the pro lens costs, look at 150 to 400. It costs like what? Five times more? <laughs> then you have the image sync. Alpoco Films said, but you're absolutely correct with everything else, I agree. All right, uh, Denzel said, uh, Hi Robin, because of your video, I'm considering about getting 75 f1.8. It's such an amazing lens. But when I consulted about it with my friends, they said it's better to get 17 f1.8 first. What are you shooting? Like they are both extremely different lenses, right? I use 75 f1.8 to shoot concerts, to shoot stage photography, to shoot dance, to shoot theater, to shoot like events. Let's say there is a VIP giving a speech uh, on the podium on stage and I use the 75 f1.8. So depends on what you are shooting, right? Like it's not the lens that you use all the time. It's the same with 17. I can't use the 17 in these situations. Everyone or everything is just too far away. Use the right lens for the right situation. So the question again, like what I've answered earlier to some other people is, you have to ask yourself, what are you shooting? And you get the right lens for the right job. Denzel said, uh, it's because 75 is hard to use since you have to be far away from the subject. For context, I love taking candid photos at events. Should I delay on getting 75? Depends. Depends on what kind of shots that you do. Like, I need to be far away. I can't just climb on the stage or the podium and take photographs of the singer, right? Or, or the artist or celebrity on stage. I will get chased away by the security. So I need the distance. And that 75 gives me the distance to work with. Alessandro Zampiri said, Hello, what advice would you give to shoot panning shots at a racing circuit with the EM5 Mark III with a 40 to 150? Thank you so much and congrats on the videos. Number one, turn off the image stabilization. Number two, I think you can use the tracking. The continuous tracking is good enough. Then everything else, just play with the shutter speeds because you need slow shutter speeds, right? I can't give you the number. I, I don't know how fast the car is or where you are. Like if you're they are, they are at the turn, they are slowing down. So you might need to use different speeds. So you can use like one of a 60th of a second, one of a 100, one of a 200. Depends. Like if it's really fast, then maybe one of a 200, you still can get like really smooth panning. But if it's not fast enough, you might need to slow down your shutter to say one of a 100, one of a 60th. Shutter speed, you got to play around, experiment a little bit to get the number for that particular situation. But other than that, turn off the image stabilization and... Continuous other focus, right? Exploring with Rotten Fish said, any news for the new Olympus camera this year? Nope, I am not connected to OM Digital Solutions anymore. I don't get any information and I read the rumor sites like everyone else now. Pete Photography said, Alpaca Films, you're clueless. Uh, okay, that's a little bit I don't know what you're referring to, but I'm going to move on. Evening Me said, I watched Richard Wan's video, Autofocus G9 Mark II versus OM1, and I feel that the autofocus of the G9 Mark II is quite impressive. However, I've always felt that the autofocus on the OM1 isn't particularly reliable. Ha, <laughs> tell me about it. I made three videos to talk about how disappointed I was with the OM1's autofocus. I'm not going to go there. Let's move back to the topic of discussion today, which is, is Micro Four Thirds good enough? And I'm going to sip some coffee before we continue. Hmm. All right, where were we just now? Okay. So we talked about uh, earlier why Micro Four Thirds is important in the camera industry because Micro Four Thirds was the one that push the camera market towards mirrorless. They showed what mirrorless cameras are capable of, 
Panasonic showed that you can use the, the micro four thirds or mirrorless cameras for serious video work, whereas Olympus showed the DNA or the blueprint of a professional grade camera, which everyone else followed, right? Even Sony, Fuji, and subsequently everyone else. And they also introduced a very powerful image stabilization and how image stabilization can benefit both uh, the photo taking as well as the video recording, right? And because now, if think about it, if image stabilization is not important, why is every single camera out there having image stabilization from Fuji, if you look at SH2, SH2S, the XT series cameras, they all have image stabilization built into the camera. Canon R5, R6, they have image stabilization built into the camera. Sony S7R, S7 Mark IV, S7 whatever, S7C Mark whatever, everything has image stabilization. Even Nikon, the Z8, even currently the latest ZF um, full frame retro look camera, they all have image stabilization so but where did it come first right it was micro photo system that first popularized this and showed that the difference that it makes in the world now i will be very honest though like in extreme challenging conditions micro four thirds may not be able to deliver in really really crazy situations i've mentioned this earlier answering to someone's question about uh in what situation will i go away from micro four thirds so one situation will be high megapixels because let's face reality there are clients or there are demands for high megapixel imaging that's why there is medium format say that i have uh, an agency that's willing to work with me and i will need to produce high resolution images and the agency say I, we need like 100 megapixels. Then of course, I will go for medium format cameras, either from Hasselblad, Fuji, Phase One. I may be leaning more towards Fuji because they're more on the affordable side of things. Hasselblad is a little bit out of my reach, but you get what I mean. These cameras, they produce excellent 100 megapixels files and they are beefy in terms of resolution, dynamic range, tonality, and color fidelity. They are way ahead of what we can get from full frame cameras. So in terms of if you want pure resolution, medium format is the way to go. And if you compare what Micro Four Thirds has to offer these days, Micro Four Thirds is lagging far behind. I'm just going to be very honest here. Then in terms of extreme low light condition, say I'm going to shoot a stage, just candlelit, right? And I'm going to use ISO 1 million. Or if I were to go to the beach and shoot an event with no additional lighting and the only light available is the moonlight. So to turn the night into day kind of situation, Micro Four Thirds is not going to cut it. And there are cameras that are capable of doing so, say the Sony A7S Mark III, where you can shoot at ISO 100,000 or 1 million, it can turn like night into day. I admit that I can't do that with Micro Four Thirds cameras, even the latest, the OM1 or the G9 Mark II. You just cannot do that. And even if most uh, full frame cameras, you can't do that. You know, not any Canon, Nikon, or Sony cameras can can perform in that situation. Only the A7S and maybe a select few other cameras can deliver the shots in such challenging situations. Now, extreme conditions out of the way. I don't shoot at the beach. I have no clients asking me to shoot in such crazy condition. Uh, I don't have clients demanding for 100 megapixels. And a lot of my shoots, especially product shots, I actually gave my clients an option. Hey, do you want high resolution? I can give you 50 megapixels uh, if I use the pixel shift on a tripod because let's say you're shooting food or certain products, they're not moving. So I have time to use the pixel shift method, high res shot on tripod and get like the best resolution for my clients, right? Uh, ask them if they want more resolution. And most of the time they say no. And sometimes I, I, I showed them a few times because I used tethered shooting. I took the 50 megapixel shot. I showed them. They were like, oh, this is unnecessary. They said like 20 megapixels is more than enough because my clients are so the clients, they need the photographs for the, the me let's say I'm shooting for a restaurant. They want to print a menu, whether it's a physical menu print in the restaurant or they want to print uh, the photographs to, to be used on location or they want to use on social media and 20 megapixels is plenty of pixels and it's more than enough in that situation and 90% of the time I think 95% of the time the clients will decline having the 50 megapixels and they'll just say hey, yeah 20 megapixels is more than sufficient for them so for my case that's good enough right so I just want to say putting aside the extreme conditions now why I think Micro Four Thirds is more than good enough for me. I have shot 
jobs since I don't know, like eight, ten years ago. And I've been I've gone full time maybe four or five years ago. And I've been shooting with micro four thirds exclusively, right? My cameras have been EMR Mark II. EMR Mark III for a period of time. Recently, I've tried the OM-1 and I went back to EMR Mark II. I gave away my EMR Mark III in case some people are wondering what happened to the EMR Mark III. Okay. All this time, there are challenging, challenging situations, which one of the example is the video that I've just published on Monday where I have to shoot ISO 2800. There are also some challenging situations where there are dynamic range issues where I need to balance the light from the dark and bright area. There are situations where I find it to be, you know, like, hey, this actually push the camera's boundaries. This really tests the capabilities of the cameras. But every single time I come back uh, with, with my camera, the SD card, I load the photographs and I look at the photographs. I seldom miss shots. And if I miss shots, it's not the camera's fault. It's my fault. Like whether I'm not ready, whether like I was doing something else and something happens, uh, I didn't prepare myself to capture the shot. Uh, and most of the time, in terms of image quality, after a little bit of editing, like recovering the details on the highlights and push the shadow a little bit, they look okay. And I've shared plenty of these shots on my YouTube channel. Um, you can look at my portfolio. I've been shooting weddings as well before this, a lot with micro four thirds. My clients have always been happy. The images have always been sufficient, more than sufficient. And my clients never ask for more background blur. They never complain that the bokeh is not good enough. They never complain that the color is not good enough. They never complain about noise or dynamic range or blown highlights or anything. It has always been more than good enough. Now, here's the thing. I admit that if you use a full-frame camera, you, you can push two stops better high ISO performance. You can get two stops better dynamic range. I'm not against that. But here's another question to you. Like, if for me, I can speak for myself, right? I can't speak for you. So whatever I'm talking here is, is applicable to my own experience. I'm sharing my experience as a professional photographer shooting exclusively with micro four thirds. Now, if I'm already so confident that whatever this... EM1 Mark II can do for me. That like I've been shooting with this for years and years and I've been delivering great results for my clients. I get paid, my clients keep coming back to me and they tell me that they're amazed with the images that I, I have and that they have no issue hiring me again for the future shoots. I have a lot of uh, recurring and loyal clients, right? I've forged some business partnerships with these people. If this EM1 Mark II is more than sufficient to get the job done, if the micro four thirds is enough, Right? I already have EMR Mark II and a plethora of lenses. I've built the system. Why would I need to give this up to go to another system? Even if the other system offers, say, more megapixels, better dynamic range, better high ISO. The only reason for me to upgrade is if that camera has something that my camera doesn't have. If that camera can do something extremely well, I don't know yet. I don't know, it depends on the camera manufacturers to come up with this invention. If you're telling me that, Robin, have you tried this uh, Sony A7 uh, Mark IV or 7R Mark V, you know, or A7C R Mark II, you know, wow, he has 61 megapixels, wow, his ISO 1 million, blah, 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 but I'm like, but I don't need them. <laughs> At least not yet, right? When I need it, then maybe I will go there, but now I don't need them. Like, my clients, like, I'm shooting wedding, and last weekend I was doing uh, uh, wedding reception. I'm shooting a lot of events, uh, all these shoots, right? They are fast paced. I come home with thousands and thousands of shots. Like, high resolution is just gonna kill me in terms of memory card, in terms of storage, in terms of processing power. I need to edit those images one by one. It's going to kill me. I'm so comfortable handling smaller files, like 20 megapixels, and for now, people shots, event shots, even wedding shots, which I did last weekend, is more than sufficient to do the job, right? So if that's the, the case, then I don't see the need to go for full frame. Not only it will cost more, but there are a lot of disadvantages as well, because full frame cameras, generally the lenses are quite large and they're more expensive. And like I've said this, the magic happens in lenses. See how tiny this lens is. This is the 45 f1.8, right? This is my bread and butter, the lens I use for most of my shoots and I get like amazing photographs with this lens. I've been using this for more than 10 years now. And this is also my main lens that I use for my YouTube channel, for my talking headshots. Uh, 
Tell me, 85 millimeters equivalent full frame, can you get it in this size? Even an 85 millimeters lens in full frame, you can't even get it in this particular size, which is a 75 f1.8. This 75 f1.8 is already so small, and yet it gives an equivalent of 150 millimeters f1.8 reach. You cannot get this with full frame. And because these lenses are so tiny, right? They're so small. I'm going to hold this up here and I'm going to hold this up here. You see, they're so tiny, right? These lenses are so small and so light and it's like so incredibly good and they're still so sharp and because they're f1.8 so I can show in low light, no problem. Because the lenses are so small, I can run around easily. When I'm doing wedding, I need to move a lot. And when I'm on, let's say I was doing a festival recently, I was shooting a full weekend Saturday and Sunday festival, I need to move a lot. And you know what? Smaller cameras, I can pack like five of these lenses with two camera bodies in a bag, no problem. Imagine if I carry two large uh, full frame mirrorless bodies with like four or five large lenses running around. I will break my shoulder, my back, my wrist, my fingers. It's crazy. It's just not the same. And I really treasure the agility to move around with smaller cameras with smaller lenses. There's less chance of me knocking on people, as uh, bumping into people as I run around. And it's just so much easier to move. And definitely, I've said this before, one tip to get great photographs if you're shooting events, if you're doing stage photography, if you're doing live music, anything, right? You have got to move. Go near, go far, go left, go right, change positions, find different compositions and framing so that at the end of the day, your shots, the portfolio of photographs that you give to your client will be more dynamic. You have more variation of shots and different compositions, more creative things to show your client. It's always about movement. You have got to move. And with larger lenses, I've seen a photographer in the same shoot as I did using a Z9 with like, I don't know, 7200 on a monopod that is not agile <laughs> I need to be able to run I need to be able to move quickly and having a monopod or a tripod with such a large camera and lens it doesn't work for me right and another point I want to emphasize on why Micro Four Thirds is still capable and if I was talking about a professional photographer's point of view, like autofocus is still delivers. I really treasure the image stabilization. I treasure that these cameras are well built, they're weather sealed. I've used this EM, EM1 Mark II for like, I don't know, six years now, coming to five, six years, okay, in focus, and I've encountered zero issues with it. And even if there's any problems, I'll just bring it back to the service. Uh, no, I wouldn't hesitate to use this whatsoever. It still serves me really well until today. Reliability of the camera is amazing and it's weather sealed. I've shot under the rain, no problem. Uh, there's one video where I was literally stuck in the rain. It was a thunderstorm when I was making the video. I don't know if you guys saw that. Uh, in terms of reliability, the cameras perform, they deliver their shots, no issue. Now, coming to a hobbyist point of view, if you are not a professional photographer, if you're just a hobbyist, look at these cameras. Look at what Micro Four Thirds can do. Look at the size of this. This is the GM1 the world's smallest interchangeable lens camera. Look at the size of this, and yet it has a full micro four thirds image sensor. I'm gonna open this up and show you the sensor inside. Look at how tiny it is. And I can see this in focus. Focus, focus, focus. Yep, there you go. Look at how small the camera is. All right, let me bring it nearer to my face and see the size <laughs> of the camera with my face, yep. And only because the micro photos sensor is smaller, they can make this camera so small, right? And of course, you pair with the right lens, you can make it a really compact setup. Not only that, look at this EP1, sorry, EPM1 Olympus Pan Mini. Look at how tiny it is. Look at how small it is. It's amazing. Small cameras. And these cameras are so fun. I'm not asking them to make such tiny cameras. Like even the EM10 series cameras are really small. Even the EPL7 series cameras are really small. And the Panasonic, say the GX series cameras or the GF series cameras, they are really small as well. So because of the smaller sensor and the smaller lenses, they can create truly minimalist, truly tiny footprint setup that nothing from APS-C or full frame can do. 
that can make small cameras but equivalent lenses, you, they cannot make a 85 or 90 millimeters lens as small as this. This is the eight, uh, 45 f1.8. And if you guys have not used this lens before, I tell you, this is amazing. This is my bread and butter lens. It has given me fantastic shots. My clients are always very happy with the shots that I get from this lens. The bokeh, man, the bokeh is delicious. Same with this uh, 75 f1.8. I want to emphasize how tiny this lens is. It's like just next to my face, how tiny this is. Yeah, your full frame camera is amazing, but I like my small lenses. I just love them. I can carry my small lenses and cameras around. I don't feel anything in my... I don't have to break my back to do my photography job. And I intend to continue shooting until old age, and I don't want to break my back. You know what, guys? Like, you guys will think that, ah, oh, you know, how heavy is the camera and lens? I have wedding photographer friends who have slipped this carrying full frame cameras and it's not even dslr it's just full frame camera with like a 70 200 lens they have slipped this they have like problems with their ankle oh this one friend actually broke her ankle carrying a 70 200 lens no joke like i really appreciate my health and i want to take care of it and one way to take care of myself is to use smaller and lighter cameras and lenses for my jobs i'm sh doing shoots fairly often and even so i'm making videos more and more like carrying smaller cameras and lenses out it's just so much more liberating and it's just so much more convenient and it's easier for me to move and get my shots compared to say carrying larger format camera systems all right i hope you guys uh, agree with me let me know if you agree with my points uh, that micro four thirds is sufficient for my professional shoots i've proven that in my videos a lot one recent one and a few before that i treasure that i can carry smaller cameras set up can move around and they're more than sufficient for me that i don't see the need to upgrade let's continue on with a comment but before that let me get a quick drink <laughs> Getting a little bit thirsty. Time check, it's about almost 10.30 in Malaysia. We are about one and a half hour into the stream. And we have, wow, 119 concurrent viewers. Thanks for staying, guys. Let me get a quick drink and I'll continue with the comments. Mm. Beautiful. Okay, let me just check another item. All right. Andrew Galloway said, Micro Four Thirds is good enough most of the time, but for the times when it is not, we can use a different tool. That is correct. Like, if I need a high-resolution camera, I wouldn't hesitate to get a medium-format camera if there is a need for that, if my job demands it. Exploring with Rotten Fish said, Most important is cheaper system, but the result is wow, compares to a full-frame expensive and heavy. I think it's more like if the system can get a job done, then why spend more money, right? Phillips said, Robin, can the EM10 Mark IV do back button given the lack of customization? I don't do back button focus and I think it's a very ineffective way of shooting but uh, I don't have the EM10 Mark IV with me now uh, so I can't verify that. I'm so sorry. Where are we? Let's see. Paolo Kalha said, Hello Robin, I confirmed that the EP7 is sold in Europe. I'm the lucky owner of one white version. It's beautiful and if I'm inspired, it takes great photographs. Your energy is contagious. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paolo, for letting me know. And yes, and it's not even just in Europe, right? It's only like certain parts of Europe. It's not the entire Europe. And it's crazy. I wish the EP7 is here though. I would love to play with one. Icarus Chung said, Hey Robin, happy Mid Autumn Festival. Happy Mid Autumn Festival to you too. Shoot the moon and let's do this. <laughs> I doubt that we can see the moon here in Malaysia. I think it's a little bit hazy. We have the haze problem. Uh, our neighboring countries, they are burning the forest. So yeah, everything looks very blurry now, even the sky. John Yazi said uh, to Andrew Galloway. Okay, you guys are talking to each other. Jet Set Journeys said, good evening from Thailand. Sir Robin and Chad. Hey, Jet Set Journeys. Nice to see you here. Muktadir Ali said, hi everyone, hello, thanks for dropping by. Blaine Winford said, Micro Four Thirds is good enough for me primarily because I don't do much super low light shooting and the weather sealed lenses are still relatively lighter. I don't mind having a full frame with two lenses for other jobs. That's true. Jono said, my back, wrist, leg, brains all broken because I carry a 7 Mark 4 and 250 f1.2, 85 f1.2 signal. Ah, you are exaggerating, man. Yeah, but, but then again, looking at the kind of shots that you're able to do, uh, I think it's all worth the trouble, right, John? 
like what the 50 f1.2 can do and what the 85 f1.4 can do <laughs> the bokeh man he's in the bokeh Wei Yan Lo said, oddly enough, I've shot in the worst lighting conditions, underground metal concerts, etc. on micro four thirds, especially since I use cheap old lenses for my beloved CCTV lenses. I love the grainy film look. Well, if you like the grain and the high ISO uh, imperfections, then go for it. No issue whatsoever. Wei Yan Lo continued to say, also, hi Robin, long time fan, hoping someday to turn on for a photo walk. Yeah, no worries. It'll be great to, to chew with some people. Number six says, was that a lens cap lens for your EPM-1? Yes, this is the 7 Artisans 18mm f6.3 Mark II. They have one that looks like a UFO design, the Mark I, which I think looks really ugly and it's like more expensive. The Mark I version costs like 370 something ringgit. This is only 180. 70 ringgit this costs half the price this is mark 2 and i thought it looks really good and it's actually quite decent i did a video with this already you can look it up i'm gonna have one more video coming out with this seven artisans 18 uh 6.3 right manila martin said love seeing micro photos shooters still making videos i'm excited for the g9 mark 2 well there are a lot of micro four thirds uh, youtubers out there i'm one of them we have jimmy chang from red 35 making amazing videos we have micro four nerds uh, emily uh in the in london i think she's amazing as well i love her videos and i love her photography uh, we have uh, peter force god i think he's still although he's no longer an olympus ambassador or, or am ambassador he's still making a lot of uh, videos for micro four thirds system and there are a lot of other great micro four thirds content creators out there so we are not lack of micro four thirds content john wyduck said hi robin hey i have an olympus omd em1 mark 3 and i love this system because of the size and weight and total convenience that is true the size and weight is truly important people underestimate how important it is to have compact system and so that you can move around easier John Yazi said, for general shooting, I usually have a zoom on the camera plus a fast prime or two and an extra battery in my pocket. That's my kit. No bag. I'll carry like a small bag, a sling bag. I can fit a lot of things. It's just so much more convenient. If I want to change lens, it, it helps if I have like a place to drop something, right? Just a journey said, smash that thumb up button. Thank you so much for the reminder. I appreciate that. Pankaj and Josh, Joshi said, I agree with your point about smaller and lighter gear. As a bird photographer, I need to hike and move a lot and find it liberating to move without a tripod. That is very true. Having a handheld freedom, like not needing to carry a monopod or tripod, it just makes things so much more convenient. John Wada said, have to run, going to dentist. Oh no, <laughs> I hope nothing serious, man. All right, see you around, John. Thanks for dropping by. Andrew Galloway said, unlike Robin, I have a few all manual lenses that I use, not for any kind of professional work, for just for fun. I like how they force me to slow down and become more deliberate. Yeah, I can't afford to slow down. Hey, even for my personal projects, like I'm doing my street photography, things are always on the move. And if I were to shoot a manual, uh, if I were to shoot strangers on the street doing portraits, right? I can't just say, oh, wait, wait, just give me a moment. Yeah, I almost got it. Yeah, just, just hold that pose. Don't look away, look in the, almost got it. Click, check the photograph. Oh, I missed this by like a little bit. Oh, just take another shot. Just gonna, no, it doesn't work. What is, hey, can I take a photograph? Yeah, sure. Smile, click, done. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see how this doesn't work for my kind of photography? I cannot, I need to speed up. People don't wait. You know, when I see something happening, it's either you click it or you miss it. <laughs> Heng Hao Lo said, possible to use the EM10 Mark IV without worrying too much on the cold weather or in light drizzle, not exposing under heavy rain or snow though. If so, what can be done? Holding an umbrella. Yeah, I think holding an umbrella works or you can like put a sheet of plastic or the bag around the camera that will help to protect the camera as well. Abdul Rahim Al My Money said, Hello Robin, I'm new guy here. Please let me understand this better. Micro Four Thirds 20 f1.2. I don't think we have a 21.2. I think we have an OM system 20 millimeters f1.4. 
Is it 40 f2.8 or is it it will be 40 but f1.2 in full frame? No, okay. I think you're referring to 20 f1.4. There's no 20 f1.2 lens. So in terms of full frame, you get an equivalent focal length of 40 millimeters. That's just how the framing works. You use a 40 millimeters lens on full frame, it's equivalent to the framing of a 20 millimeters lens on micro four thirds in terms of angle of view, in terms of coverage, the focal length 20 is 40. 20 micro four thirds is 40 in full frame. In terms of aperture, it gets a little bit tricky. In terms of light gathering capability, an f1.4 in micro four thirds, it gathers as much light as f1.4 in full frame because in terms of ISO values, in terms of shutter speed, f1.4 is f1.4 regardless of whatever you use, whether it's on smartphones, whether it's on FPS-C sensor, whether it's on medium format, f1.4 is f1.4. What you are confused about is shallow depth of field. How much shallow depth of field is f1.4 in micro four thirds and how much depth of field is the f1.4 in full frame. So the f1.4 depth of field in micro four thirds is about equivalent to f2.8 in full frame. So you can't just say, oh, f2.8 is f1.4. No, like what are we talking about specifically? Is it light gathering capability or is it the depth of field rendering? So you gotta be more specific here. Horton Griffith said, you have several videos on EPM-1, would you use it for video? No, I think EPM-1 is just too old for any video. For video, micro four thirds, you have got to use anything older than EM-1 Mark II and anything with face detection autofocus. So that limits it, right? There's only a few choices, seriously. It's either EM-1 Mark II, EM-1X, EM-5 Mark III, EM-1 Mark III, or the OM-1 or OM5, of course, the new one, which is, I thought is negligible because it's similar to EM5 Mark III. But there's like only six or seven cameras they can choose from to do like serious video work because anything else, they don't have face detection on the focus. And EPM1, they don't even, that doesn't even have a 4K video. And I wouldn't, I will not. <laughs> it's just, it sets the bar too low. Hishan Munro, hey, nice to see you here. Uh, hello again from the Isle of Wight in the UK. Micro Four Thirds is good enough for me. I'm slightly semi-pro with only one client. I'm the only that I'm the only that one that cares about the quality of my photos. That is true. That is true. It's definitely good enough. James Provenzano said, Hi, great work, Robin. I'm still using first EM5. Satisfies all my needs for prints up to 13 by 19. I want to try it with IR filter without doing any type of conversion. Well, go ahead, man. It's always good to try different aspects of photography. I think IR photography can be really fun. I think you're just attaching a filter in front of the lens, right? You can, you can open up to a different world of, of photography altogether. Jacob Brew Baker said, just discovered your videos recently, getting back into photography after a hiatus. Going to switch from my older APS-C Nikon equipment, ran a photo studio years ago to Micro Four Thirds. Thanks for your content. Welcome to the Micro Four Thirds world. I think you'll enjoy it and go out and take more photographs. And welcome back to photography. I think photography is really, really fun and everyone should enjoy taking some photographs. Abdul Rahim said, hey, yeah, sorry, 20 f1.4. Yeah, that's the lens was, you were referring to, right? Uh, yep, no worries. Glad you found my explanation useful. Santis said, Lumix 20 f1.7 is really slow and hands when used in low light. Yep, it was the first generation lens from Lumix. Not just Lumix, right? Any older lens from Olympus or Panasonic, they are just unbearably slow. Like, for example, the Olympus 17 f2.8. Not a fast lens at all. Or the older 14 to 42 original kit lens from Olympus. These are really slow lens. And, you know, because it's an old lens, it was the first lens, and, you know, they are still figuring things out. I can forgive that it's slow. I'm just hoping that Panasonic will update the 20 f1.7 with a faster autofocus mechanism. I hope that happens. Horton Griffiths said, thank you so much for what you're doing. You're doing a great job. Thanks for the wisdom. Thanks. Uh, I share whatever I can. Um, I do enjoy interacting with the community and I share my photographs and it, thanks for letting me know that you found them useful. Santix said, Robin, you wear glasses. Do you have issues to see EVF completely or the glasses get in the way? I've been wearing glasses recently. It seems to interfere with viewing EVF fully. I have no issues with my electronic viewfinder. Uh, let's just turn this on. Do I have a battery inside? Yeah.
I can see the entire viewfinder, no issue. No problem whatsoever. This is the um, EM1 Mark II. No problem. Uh, I think... I don't know if your lens... Because like... Like the position of our glasses in our eye and how far it is away from the viewfinder, it's it's just different. Uh, but I guess one way is to make the viewfinder because there are different views, right? You can set different views of the viewfinder. So instead of like using the entire screen, maybe you can make it a little bit smaller. That's one way of getting about the problem. King Aoki said, "Hi, thanks for your content. No worries. Glad that I can share and let. Thanks for letting me know that you appreciate them." All right, I am going to go back to the topic of discussion. Is Micro Four Thirds good enough? <laughs> I'm going to drink some water first. Keep the comments coming, guys. Uh, currently, we have uh, about 120 viewers. Wow, that's a lot of people. And uh, we are about 1 hour and 40 minutes in the stream. Ah. Uh. Okay, coming back to the topic of discussion. So just now I mentioned that uh, Micro Four Thirds, or specifically the Olympus OMD system, was good enough for my jobs. Managed to get the job done. I've never had issues where I need more megapixels or more dynamic range, or I have issues with high ISO. Never encountered them. And I appreciate that the cameras and lenses are smaller so that I can move around a lot quicker. I can be more agile and I can move right without breaking my back or struggling with my wrist or having pain all over my body after a shoot i never encountered that now um i also mentioned that the micro photo system they can make smaller cameras and smaller lenses for hobbies who may not need to use cameras for professional shoots so the smaller smaller bodies like gm1 apm1 it's only possible because of the smaller sensor size now i want to share my hope or my wish for Micro Four Thirds, like, because I, I do care about Micro Four Thirds system. I've invested so much in Micro Four Thirds. I'm still using Micro Four Thirds as my workhorse, and of course, for my personal shoots. And I also want Micro Four Thirds to succeed. And I really, really hope that they can continue to, to come up with great products for us because, hey, we are the greatest supporters, right? That's why we're here. And I still believe in the Micro Four Thirds philosophy. So now the first thing that I want to see coming out from Micro Four Thirds is image sensor improvement. I think someone has mentioned this before earlier, somewhere in the comments or in the previous stream. Uh, I, for me, it's not so much of the resolution. I think 20 megapixels for me is sufficient, but any increase is appreciated. Uh, maybe we can get like 25 to 30 megapixels. We already have a 25 megapixels image sensor in GH6 and G9 Mark II. However, those sensors also don't show any improvement in terms of dynamic range or high ISO shooting. So for me, uh, maybe one stop of high ISO, uh, noise control and one stop of better dynamic range that will really be appreciated if it's not impossible to make in the next sensor because it's not that I'm saying it's not enough like currently I'm happy with what I get from my EM1 Mark II or the EM1 Mark III like I'm happy with the high ISO dynamic range and everything I have no complaint but I also want progress because everyone else is progressing even Fuji has a 40 megapixel image sensor with the very decent performance in terms of high ISO and dynamic range and Sony continues to push what they can do in terms of their image sensors in their full frame cameras and everyone is getting better and better and they're pushing new image sensors in each generation even Canon and Sony now has really impressive imaging performance in the image sensor though I think Nikon gets the sensor from Sony but Canon has their own sensors and their image sensors are also looking not bad they are really performing really well and you know it's like what i'm saying is everyone is getting better everyone is pushing boundaries everyone is releasing new sensors and everyone is like trying to squeeze that every last drop of whatever they can get from the image sensor and we are still stuck with this image sensor on this em1 mark ii from like six or seven years ago this was launched in 2016 and whatever new cameras that comes out now, even like the GH6 or the OM1 or the like the G9 Mark II, they are not that much better than what we get from six to seven years ago in this EM1 Mark II. So I think that's a little bit disappointing. Like I'm not asking for miracles. I'm not asking for Micro Four Thirds to match or come close to full frame 
physically and scientifically, it's just not possible. That's too much to ask for. But I'm asking for a little bit of progress. I've, I'm asking for anything. Even one stop of dynamic range improvement, one stop of high ISO, I don't think that's too much to ask for. All I want is to see a little bit of commitment. All I want is to see a little bit of improvement. And I think that after all these years, in terms of technology improvement, in terms of uh, knowing how to optimize the image sensor or how to design a better image sensor with all the technologies that we have with the deep well pixel, how do you saturate the pixels or how to make the pixel sites bigger or all this technology with backside illuminated, with stacks and so whatever, with all this technology, I would think that it is possible to make better micro four thirds sensors at this point. And we are not seeing it. So I really want, to, number one, if Micro Four Thirds is to stay competitive, like I've mentioned earlier, like Micro Four Thirds proof that professional photography is possible with mirrorless. And they've done wonders in EM1 Mark I, EM1 Mark II, and you know Panasonic has done wonders showing the video capabilities in GH, GH series, right? GH2, GH3, now GH6. So yes, Micro Four Thirds have proven that they are capable as professional systems. But in order to stay relevant, in order to stay competitive, they must also continue to push what the imaging capabilities can do. At least the basic stuff, like resolution, high ISO and dynamic range. You just got to push this because everyone is going so far already and it's like Micro Four Thirds is being left behind. The second thing that I want to see improve in Micro Four Thirds is autofocus performance. Now, I'm not asking for miracles. I'm not saying that autofocus is bad at this point, but I do want the autofocus to get better. And from what I'm seeing so far, I'm not impressed with what OM Digital Solutions is doing with the OM1. Everyone is saying, yeah, you know, it can just track the bird. I can get like more keepers in bird of flight. Well, I can't find a client that's willing to buy bird in flight photographs in Malaysia. Sorry, I'm just sorry to say this. Yeah, it can satisfy you as a hobbyist. Good. I'm happy for you, but I need to pay my bills. If I go on and shoot burning flights, no one's going to buy my photographs. I, I, I can't survive on birds' photographs, you know? So I still shoot weddings. I still shoot uh, events. I st still shoot products. I shoot portraits. These are the kind of professional photography that pays. I need to eat, man. <laughs> So like basic autofocus systems, like single autofocus and continuous, continuous autofocus, they still don't get it right. There's just so much error. I'm not going to go into specifics or details because I've talked about this in three videos. If you're interested, you can dig back my channel, my problems with the OM1 autofocus. I just need to see improvements. They just need to work this out. And I think it's not impossible. Autofocus is very important. And of course, what they need to do, Micro Four Thirds, is to listen to customers. Now, I, I, I got to admit, kudos to Panasonic. Finally, they listened. In the G9 Mark II, they implemented the phased detect autofocus. Phase as in P-H-A-S-E. Right. Finally, after years and years and years of pleading and begging and screaming and I don't know, Finally, they included the face detection autofocus in the G9 Mark II and hopefully they include this in subsequent cameras like the GX series or other lower level cameras, right? From Panasonic. And OM Digital Solutions, please listen to your customers. No more micro USB crap that you put in that OM5. We need USB-C and you have got to really, really beef up your camera innovation. You have got to give your customers what they want. For example, the EM10 series cameras, it is a no brainer that you can just turn it into the best selling vlogging camera to compete with the RX100 series cameras that are selling like left, right, front, center. You can compete with the A7C cameras from Sony. For the OM5 or the OM10, sorry, the, the EM10 series cameras, right? If the OM Digital Solution is going to come out with the camera, just listen to your customers. Include a microphone jack, like seriously. You enable, you, you were promoting the EM10 Mark IV, like, wow, now we have 4K recording, you know, like we have a new sensor or whatever, but you don't even have a microphone jack. Like, what's with this? Even the Pan series cameras like EPL10 or whatever that's coming up next, please include mi microphone input. That is just something so basic. It doesn't cost so much money. Why can't you include that? It does not make sense. <laughs> Listen to your customers 
And these are the small things that you can implement. I just don't see how you can miss this. Okay, coming back to the content. Uh, Olivier Gardin said, Hello Robin, thank you so much for all your videos. You bring so much for photographers, especially for micro photos. I'm glad that I can contribute in whatever small ways that I can to the community. And thanks for being here. I really appreciate you as well. Sorry, I can't pronounce your name. In Japan, some girls using micro photo system. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry about the burp. Uh, in Japan, some girls using micro photo system taking flowers. Yeah, I think that's amazing, right? You can use it to take flowers as well. Santix said, I guess I shall not wear glasses for my next wedding shoot. Well, just like astigmatism for my eyes. If not wrong, the EM5 Mark III EVF is better for glasses wearer. That's not true. I have no issue wearing using any of my EM1 series cameras with my glasses, doing weddings, uh, having full day shoots. No problem as well. I am back in KL. I came back on Monday. I'm back in KL now. Albio Vivas said, Hi, just waiting if OM system wakes up after G9 Mark II. I don't think... Okay. OM Digital Solutions, currently, they are probably still releasing cameras, the remnants from the Olympus product strategy. You know, you do plan products like two or three years in advance. You don't just, hey, I want to make a new camera and it comes out in, in one month. No, it takes years to make a product, right? So I would think that OM1 or the OM5, they were made by Olympus. They're just released by OM Digital Solutions with the rebrand, of course. So it's interesting to see what OM Digital Solutions will be making next by themselves, uh, having their own input in making the next camera. And they don't need to wake up after the G9 Mark II. I don't think G9 Mark II is a miracle camera. I'm glad that Panasonic finally included a the face detect autofocus. I'm glad that they are taking this seriously and we can see that uh, Panasonic is still dedicated or they're still committed in making great products for Micro Four Thirds. That's great. But G9 Mark II is G9 Mark II. OM1 is OM1 and it's good for us to have options, right? And OM Digital Solutions, they are not making too many mistakes. They make some mistakes. I gotta say, I'm not being quiet about that. But I think they are they're on the right direction. And the thing the key thing here is for them to listen to their customers. If they can do that, yeah, there's, there's nothing to worry about. And here is the thing: OM Digital Solutions should not be fighting Panasonic. Panasonic is not the enemy. They are sharing the same mount. And like I'm using Panasonic lenses on my Olympus bodies, right? You see? And I have Panasonic bodies as well. And a lot of Olympus shooters have Panasonic bodies. A lot of Olympus shooters have Panasonic lenses. And a lot of Panasonic shooters have Olympus lenses. We are in the same ecosystem. We are in the same family. We shouldn't be fighting. And there's nothing for OM to wake up. There's nothing. What they can do is to continue to make great products, whether they wake up or not. They have to make great products, right? Olivier Gardan said, still on Lumix 20 f1.7, so slow but good quality. I'm still struggling to find an equivalent small prime lenses uh, to replace it to photograph friends at small distance and low light shooting conditions. You can consider Olympus 17 f1.8, you can consider Panasonic 15 f1.7, you can consider uh, any of the 25mm lenses. We are not lack of options. Like I said, in terms of prime lenses, we have 9, we have uh, 12, 14, 15, 16, we have 17, we have 19, we have 20, we have uh, 25, we have 30, we have 42.5, we have 45, we have 60, we have 75. We are not lack of options when it comes to prime lenses. Stephen Hughes said, I've never had any issues with the quality of micro photos images. With the improvements in noise reduction software, it's the problem of noise becoming less now as it can be removed effectively in post. I have no issues with the noise. So I don't use any noise reduction softwares. And I thought that the noise in the images that adds structure to the image, it makes it look a little bit more organic or more natural, if you ask me. Like, I wouldn't want to smooth out the image entirely. It will just look too um, clinical or too fake or too polished, if you get what I mean. If you're after that look, uh, I'm not against it. Uh, if you love it, go for it. I just appreciate the grain. I don't think that it's destructive to the image. I thought it's fine, unless you pixel pit like 200%, which you shouldn't be doing anyway, right? 
Suntix said, hey, if you happen to know the pinouts for the battery grip connector, the one underneath the camera under the rubber cap, maybe people can make accessories using that connector. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Third party manufacturers. Greg Bremert said, my street camera is the Lumix GS1 with new lenses. It's all I need for this purpose. Love it. Yeah, the GS1 is such a great camera, right? I should find what use you need and start making videos about it. Billy Sukma Dwi Prasetyo said, Micro Four Thirds is good enough. I just got a used EM10 Mark III last week and used it for a cosplay event the day after. I'm really happy with the results. Yeah, EM10 Mark III is such an amazing, amazing camera. I really love the EM10 series. I think it's the best value uh, for Olympus cameras because it's like a mini OMD. It has all the best parts of the EM1 series, but in like a, a non weather sealed, a non magnesium alloy, but like a way smaller body. Exploring with Rotten Fish said, Sensor is not the issue. Even the Nikon P1000 uses much smaller sensor than Micro Four Thirds, but with great light. That's true, but uh, like I said earlier, like if you missed this, the Micro Four Thirds is like the smallest sensor that I will go to. Like I tried the one inch sensor, it's just, it doesn't give me the results that I need. Like Micro Four Thirds is like the minimum that I would go. Nicole said, hi Robin. Hey Nicole, thanks for being here. Except the Pancake Lumix 20 f1.7, do all Panasonic lenses have fast autofocus with Olympus OM cameras? Thank you and I'm delighted to follow your live from Strasbourg. So far, all the Panasonic lenses that I've used, the autofocus have been quite fast. I have three Panasonic lenses now, the Lumix 12-32 Pancake kit lens, the 15 f1.7, uh, which, has, which carries a Leica badge, this is the 15 f1.7 uh, Panasonic lens, which I also really like. I think it's a great lens. This is my favorite street lens for now. I use this for my wide-angle street photography very often. I also have a lens, the ultra wide-angle lens, which is the Panasonic uh, 9 f1.7, uh, which is wide-angle lens, which I use for my jobs a lot. And this is also my main vlogging lens. I think this is really sharp. It's so compact and it has bright f1.7 aperture. And it also carries a Leica branding. I really love this lens. So I have three Panasonic lenses. I've used a lot of other Panasonic lenses as well uh, on my own Olympus bodies. They all perform incredibly well. No slowing down in autofocus whatsoever. It's just as fast as my Olympus lenses. Herb Thompson said, I find myself using high ISOs 1000 to 3000 to freeze movement with wildlife, which oddly enough is not normally a preferred subject, at least not until I switch to micro four thirds. EO Mark II in Omaha. Uh, NE, where is that? Sorry. <laughs> New something? New England, I think. Yeah, EMR Mark II is great, and I think ISO 1000 to 3000 is not a problem with EMR Mark II. Yeah, shooting with wildlife, which is amazing. Number six said, why can't we have a Micro Four Thirds 2 megapixels S sensor? Why can't we have a Micro Four Thirds monochrome sensor? Yeah, I think that like if they were to launch a Pan F Mark II, I think it would be a great strategy to have a Pan F Mark II monochrome, like. Not just one monochrome camera, but like they have two variant, the, the normal color uh, sensor and of course a dedicated monochrome sensor because by doing so you're targeting the street market, which I think it will be beneficial. There are not many non-monochrome, true monochrome cameras out there outside of Leica universe. So we have one in the Pentax with a DSLR. So if OM Digital Solutions is bold enough to make a monochrome sensor, in the Pan F Mark II, I think that will be interesting. Joe Preet said, don't feel bad. Birds don't buy pictures of people either. Oh, that's true, hey. But they do come to people and beg for food though. Ha, huh. we should be charging them. JG52 said, as a former visionary, you should know Olympus never listed to customers or the visionaries. OM is using the same playbook. Never listed to customers or their visionaries. About what? What have they never listed to? Uh, fun fact for you, JG52, I am not only a former visionary, but I'm also a former Olympus staff. Like I work in Olympus before, I'm an employee, and I've been to Japan, I've seen the headquarters in um, Hachioji, I've seen the key people up there, the president, the, the key marketing people, the key sales people. I've seen the R&D department. I've talked to the engineers. So whatever they have not listed to customers or visionaries, I know more 
than most people. Don't forget that. <laughs> Santis said, if Olympus camera has mid shadows boost like Nikon D-Lighting, yes, they do. Ah, uh, it's a little bit tricky. It's in the highlight and shadows. So you got to play around. If you got into the highlight and shadow, press the info button that will get you into the mid shadow boost. Singstat Music said, I think micro photos is good enough, but improved picture quality in future models are welcome as progress always is. I just arrived at Planet OM5 from E3. Wow, that is a huge jump. I think you really appreciate the smaller size, right? It's so much smaller and lighter, and the focusing speed is so much faster. And man, the image quality is like almost double the resolution from E3, like from 10 megapixels to 20. And then like your dynamic range is possibly like two stops better and also high ISO performance. Like I think in E3 you can shoot at ISO 800, you see some problems already, but now you can shoot at ISO 3200, no issue whatsoever. Well, it's really a huge jump. Kra Kra said, it would be interesting to see how OM5 will be sold in Europe in 2024 due to charging legislation coming by using USB-C on devices. According to regulations, it cannot be sold. Good for them. Well, they shouldn't be selling the OM5 in the first place anyway, with such repeat specifications from EM5 Mark III. Fabricio Bomjardim said, In Brazil, GH5 and GH6 are only used for videos, but for photography, there are few uses of micro photos cameras. That's true, the GH5 and GH6 are designed more specifically for video use, so I'm not surprised that they are used for videos. HR Munro said, I suspect we are approaching the practical limits of current sensor technology with micro filters regarding noise and low ISO. Other changes, uh, pixels and faster readout rates just makes the noise ISO worse. I beg to differ. I think that there are ways to push the ISO limit and dynamic range as well. I don't think that we have reached a bottleneck or the limit. I think we can still squeeze more out of the sensor. I mean, if Micro filters and APS-C is not that far apart. They are about the same size. If they can push more from the APS-C sensor, look at what Nikon is doing, look at what Sony is doing, right? Look at what uh, Canon is doing. I think micro filters, which is like 20-30% smaller than an APS-C size sensor, they can also do the same. Roman Vaca said, is Panasonic 9 f1.7 good for astrophotography? I don't do astrophotography. I can't tell you that. I've never shot astrophotography with that lens, but I have the 9 f1.7 here somewhere. I'm going to show you. I have the f1.9 uh, f1.7, and I think this is a fantastic lens. As a lens, it is great. Uh, no issue whatsoever. I have very little complaint. I have also vlogged about this lens. I've made uh, my review. I've shared my thoughts on this uh, Panasonic 9 f1.7. Feel free to check it out. But uh, I'm not an astrophotography kind of person, so I can't answer your question there. C line said, Micro filters is good enough for me. I have a friend who insists sticking to APS-C even when this setup with multi multiple bodies and long lenses is so heavy, it has given him chronic back pain. That is true. Just APS-C with huge lenses. It's, it's not just back pain, right? It can be like you have problems with your fingers or problem with your elbow or shoulder or depends on how you use and hold a camera, right? You can have pain all over your body. So having smaller and lighter system on micro filters is definitely an advantage. And like I said, I do plan to continue shooting into old age. So using smaller cameras now will benefit me much in the future. Serpent AZ said, Hi Robin, any national parks in Malaysia you recommend to birders or wildlife photographers? Ha, not a question you can ask me. Nope. But national park, maybe Bako National Park in Borneo. You can check it out. Bako National Park or the... There is one national park in Pahang, which I can't remember the name now. But it's just national parks. Like, I don't think there are any interesting wildlife or birds there. I don't know. Maybe you can find like a tiger or something, which you may not want to meet in person. <laughs> C-Line said, Recently, I tried a compact CCD camera from 2010, and even that is still good enough for daylight street photography. Lovely bright colors on straight off camera JPEGs too. Yep. An actual camera can still produce better results than a smartphone, if you ask me. Especially the JPEG rendering, it's just so much less processing, so much less noise reduction, HDR, 
and fake sharpening it's just i don't know it's just so fake and so overcooked it looks so bad right and even these old cameras the processing is a lot simpler and it's more straight to the point and you get better results even from an old ccd camera Melnik Kinitz said, keep up the good work watching from Greece. Thank you so much. Thanks for dropping by. Talzin Hussein said, the question should be, is Micro Four Thirds good enough for what they cost? My first camera was E510 in 2009. I chose that because it was 100 less than the competition, 1000D and D40. The difference is lost. Not true. I think generally, Micro Four Thirds camera, the cost, if you look at the lenses as well, is still significantly lower than full frame. I'm going to... Give an example, right? For example, say the 40 to 150 f2.8 Pro. It costs about half or maybe it costs about 30 to 40 percent less of what a 70 to 200 f2.8 is asking for. I know people will say, but the f2.8 on full frame is not the same as the f2.8 on micro photos. Yeah, whatever, whatever. But then the 40 to 150 also has more reach. It has 300 millimeters equivalent reach versus 70 to 200 when you're, st you're stuck at 200, right? And you can add teleconverters on the 40 to 150. Yeah, it has, I mean, all the advantage it balances out, but yet it's still asking for a lot less. Another example I can give you is the excellent 12 to 40 f2.8 pro from olympus it's also asking for about half the price of say the 24 to 70 f2.8 from full frame and yet the lenses not only is more expensive but it has shorter reach whereas the olympus it has uh, until 80 which is a lot more and it has some advantages that can go closer to the subject it's just cheaper overall the cost is still a lot lower if you compare to competition do the calculations yourself, then you'll see that I'm not lying. Talzin Hussein said, a long time subscriber, keep up the good work. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate the support. JG52 said, listen, low typo, based my comment on what other visionaries had told me. Olympus always seemed to settle for good enough, not knocking Olympus gear. I still use mine even though I also shoot Sony. Okay, uh, I don't think they settle for good enough. So here is an insight that you may not get from other visionaries out there. Olympus is a small company. They don't have the same resources as Sony or Canon, where they have a lot more R&D power or they can throw around, experiment with different things, and even if they failed, it doesn't really matter. So Olympus has always had limited funds and you can really feel it, not just from the products, but also from marketing. Like they cannot go big. Somehow the marketing is always very limited in what the materials that they have, and the things, the, how wide they can push or how far they can push their marketing uh, reach. And if you compare with Sony or even um, Canon, it's a losing battle. And they know this. They don't have enough money to fight. So with whatever that they have uh, back then, uh, with the EM1 and EM1 Mark II, it's actually remarkable. And to say that they settle for good enough is not true. When they had this uh, EM1, it was like nothing in the market, EM1, when it came out. It has image stabilization, 5S6 IS, no one has that. It's a weather suit body, they didn't compromise on the build quality, and at that time, the 16 megapixel sensor in the EM1 was as good as the best APS-C camera out there, say the Nikon D7200. I did the comparison myself, and I found that the EM1 quality is actually better in some aspects, not everything. Uh, the D7200 is better in some aspects, but the EM1, can compete toe to toe, head to head, no problem. Uh, then came the EMR Mark II just three years after that with more improvements from 16 megapixels, it goes to 20 megapixels with better dynamic range and about one stop better high ISO performance. There is no small feat if you ask Olympus what they did. Did they settle for good enough back then? No, they continued to push what a camera system can do. And I really, really, uh, admire them for the ability to come up with the technological advancements, like they come up with Pro Capture Mode, Live Composite, uh, they come up with Fire Assist Image Stabilization, High Res Shot, and all these things, they are not just good enough. They are the best in the industry. <laughs> of course, the only thing that stagnated at this point is the image sensor. Right, unfortunately, and I wish there has there's been uh, more progress or improvements in the image sensor department. Frank Francois Fournier, sorry if I pronounce the name wrongly. Which camera would you recommend and which lens to take pictures of sports with great bokeh? 
I think all Olympus lenses have great bokeh, so that's out of the question. Uh, if you want to render shallow depth of field, then that's a different story. Uh, which camera and lens? If you want to do sports, then maybe OM1 uh, with a 150 to 400. I don't know, depends on what sports you're doing. All sports are different, like you can be shooting a table tennis uh, from quite a close distance, right? Or you can be shooting an MMA fight from a cage. Then you can be using something as wide as 240. You don't need like 40 to 150. Or if you're shooting a tennis tournament, then you need like a 300 millimeters lens. Uh, really depending on where you are, how much access you get to the sports. Are you in an audience? Are you the official photographer? And is it an indoor sports? Is it an outdoor sports? Like how far are you from the subject? How fast the sport is? You know, like weightlifting is also a sport. You don't need fast action lens for that. You know, you get what I mean? So that's like a too broad of a question. Alexis Coulter said, I hear the cost difference between micro filters and full frame, but how do you feel the cost equate on APS-C models and lenses? No point, because APS-C cameras, the, the image sensor is just about the same size as micro filters. Yes, it's about 20-30% larger, but the benefit is lost. Like, I compare side by side in terms of image quality, in terms of dynamic range high, so I see no difference. I'll still go back to whatever I can get from my Olympus OMD system. Jet Set Journeys said, My 13 years old GF1 beats any iPhone 14 for photography. I agree with you. Angelo Play for One said, Good point regards comparing price of micro four thirds and full frame of APS-C. An example, Panasonic G92 costs uh, 2001 euro with Nikon. Z6 Mark II costs 2200, but Panasonic S52 costs 2000. Canon R8, R8 costs 2000 and Fuji ST5 costs 1008. But then we haven't talked about lenses, right? Once you, the, the lenses entered the chat, then all the equations are thrown out of balance. Young, young and Gray, 15, said, Micro Four Thirds versus Reason Sony Gear, Leica 8 to 18, 8 to 4 equivalent depth of field is 5.6 and weighs 315. Uh, Sony 16 to 35, F4 costs only 353 grams for full frame. Bodies are similar weights, so I guess price is it. Uh, but why would you want to use a Leica 8 to 18? I'll take this any day. Panasonic 9 f1.7. Now, bring one from full frame that has this size. And this is f1.7. <laughs> there you go. I don't think you can find anything in full frame that has this size, this weight, and yet f1.7. This is 9 millimeters. So, there you go. David Sullivan said, if you could choose a larger sensor camera to have your camera back, money, no object, what camera, what purpose would you want for it? Uh, if money is no object, then a Leica. SL series cameras. But I want to wait, though, not the current Leica, because they don't have the face detection or the focus yet. So once Panasonic, they already started to, to have in the latest Leica Q3, right? So once Panasonic has, like, put on uh, or uh, have the, the face detection of the focus in the newer uh, SL series uh, lens cameras from Leica, then I'll be interested to get the Leica camera. What reason, what purpose? No reason, no purpose, just because money is no issue, and I'll just get it, and hey, it's cool to hang a red dot camera around your neck, right? Well, that's what I've been told. <laughs> Number six says, in Japan, used camera stores, there are five new Pan 7 cameras on the shelf. Cheap. Wow, that is amazing. Gordon said, Robin, you can get smaller Sony APS-C cameras and three lenses that are equal or smaller than any of micro filters camera. Total weight is less. Sh you sure? So, Gordon, where is uh, 85 equivalent at this size? I don't think it's possible. Where is a 150 equivalent at this size? This is the 75 f1.8. There is no such lens. And where is a Panasonic, okay, where is a, a wide angle 9mm f1.7 at this size and at this price? None. I have looked. There's no such lenses. And why am I asking for these three lenses? Because these are the three lenses that I use for my jobs. And I can't replace them. I can't see any of these lenses in the APS-C world. I'm sorry. Singtart Music said, 
It is the lenses that make micro photo system great. The performance versus cost is fantastic. That is true. Angelo Play for one said, Micro photos cameras are from 1000 to 2200 or M1, but in the same price, we have Nikon Z5, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of competition. That is true. Like I said, we haven't talked about lenses. I've just showed you three lenses, right? We have this, which is equivalent to 150 in terms of reach. It is tiny. And then we have this which is equivalent to 90, so we can say it's the classic uh, 85. Do you see how small this is? Let me put it nearer to my face. Do you see how small this is? FPSC? Are you sure smaller than this? Are you sure? I want to see evidence! And cheaper than this? Are you sure? <laughs> I don't even know what you guys are talking about. And then there is this. Panasonic 15 f 7 Smaller than this? Let me take this out. Smaller than this? What are you guys talking about? Smaller than this? Seriously? Which planet are you on? I haven't seen any FPS-C lenses this small. Like, guys, what are you dreaming? Smaller than micro four thirds? Really? I don't know, man. I don't know which planet you guys are from. Global Image said, I used to sell cameras and realized early on that all camera makers have strong and weak points. Finding a good balance is the key. That is correct. Every camera has uh, strengths and weaknesses. It's up to the photographer to understand how the camera works and optimize the strengths and work around the weaknesses to take advantage of the camera so that the camera will work for the photographer's advantage. Michael Go said, you wouldn't like the Leica series camera bodies. Lenses are big and heavy. Well... I just want bragging rights, right? If I have money, why don't I buy one? If money is not an issue, right? Robin's smartphones have f1.8 lenses. Are those not comparable to full frame? I really don't... Angelo, like your argument, starts to make no sense. Are you asking me to use smartphone cameras to do... to shoot a wedding? Like, seriously? Like, do you see how absurd your comment starts to sound? <laughs> Rebirth 2526 says, include the 15 f1.7 too. Exactly. Like, I've shot weddings with my micro flirt system with all these small lenses, right? Which you can't find in either full frame or APS-C variants. I'm going to show, especially I've shot a stage uh, with this. And if you don't believe me, Angelo, I have one latest video that I did, I just published. Uh, feel free to look at it and tell me the photos are not good enough. If up to your standards. If your standards are really that high and say that, oh, these micro photos are not good enough, tell me. I'm okay with that. But I can tell you seriously, you suggesting a smartphone's f1.8 and using a smartphone to shoot that, like, I don't see how this is a, a good discussion anymore. This discussion is not going anywhere. <laughs> Gordon said, try the Sony 11mm, Sigma 1850, and Sony 70 350, all about the same size and weight of the Panic equivalents. And the Epis camera is about 150 grams and less. Maybe not all lenses, but many. Why would I want to try these lenses? Gordon, look. 45 f1.8. If you've seen any of my videos, I use this. To, this is my bread and butter lens. I earn my money from this lens. 18 to 50 is not going to produce results from this lens because this reaches a 90mm f1.8, right? 70 to 350, it's not going to give me the same results as this lens as well, and they are not as small as this. And this is really, really, really cheap. It's so sharp, the bokeh is beautiful, it's amazing. This is 150 f1.8. Your 70 to 350 is not f1.8. Even if it's f2.8, it cannot give me the results of this f1.8 lens. Do you see how small this is? What equivalent are you talking about? Like, seriously? <laughs> I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. And if you say that, why these two lenses? Because if you have seen my recent video, these are the lenses that I shoot for an actual job. And I deliver these shots to my clients. I get paid. If you're asking me to get a Sigma 1850 and Sony 70 like, they don't give me the same results. Like, seriously, they don't. <laughs> and, and not to mention, they are a lot larger than this. Right? A lot larger than this. And also a lot larger than this. Why then would I want to pay for something so much more bigger and heavier 
and not get the same results. <laughs> Sorry, Gordon, your argument, it, it doesn't hold water. David Cruz said, I keep saying OM system needs to come out with a camera, not TG7, $1,000 or less, OM10, and sell a ton of them. Hey, David, nice to see you here. That's true. They need to have like a serious, maybe a micro photo sensor compact, like what the Panasonic is doing with the LX100, but maybe an Olympus spin of things that would have been really great. Global Image said, have you listed your gear list somewhere? Yes, I have a kit. Uh, you can look at my lens kit in my YouTube description. Go to the any of my YouTube videos, there's like a lens kit. Pancho Web Solutions said, hello from New York City. Hey, do you have a separate website to market your wedding photo services or do you use Blogspot exclusively? I have a portfolio page and you can find them. It's not difficult. And Trick all said, uh, this all is fun life video, like friends hanging out, ragging. Yeah, that's, that's the thing about why I'm doing this uh, live stream is so that I can engage with the audience because I've been making so many videos and people have been commenting a lot on my videos. And I'm finding it more and more increasingly difficult to reply to all comments, especially comments on my old videos. Uh, the new videos, I'll try to answer them. Even so, I get like hundreds of comments on every video and it's getting very hard. And I thought that, hey, why don't I just make a live stream here so that people can come on, uh, talk to me immediately and answer to every single one of you. Alexis Coulter said, I love micro photos. I'm a diehard and I won't give up on them. But I acknowledge my bias and objectively when you see a Sigma smaller f2.8 lenses for APS-C, I don't think the cost and size argument sticks. f2.8 in APS-C still cannot find f1.8 for micro photos. And my argument sticks. Angelo Play for One said, Robin, I advocate of devil and use all arguments that are used in all forums against micro four thirds. Those are prices of bodies full frame compared to micro four thirds, regarding equivalent lenses so f1.8 and whatever sizes. But my argument still stands. You can't find something like this, this size for full frame or APS-C, and you can't find something like this size. Uh, this is the 75, there's nothing like it. Uh, on full frame. Everything will be at least two or three times more expensive. Everything will be at least five times bigger. And I don't want to carry big lenses with me. That's just the way I shoot my photography. And one example of the photography that I did, I can't share, guys, I've done a lot of jobs, but I can't share all my photographs openly because sometimes I shoot for government, sometimes I shoot for private families, sometimes I shoot for uh, ministers, right? Uh, and they don't want to see the photographs with the family members and the homes to be out in the public. They have very private lives. And I've done a lot of events where it's closed door as well. I've done, I've also shot, uh, you know, companies with closed doors, AGM meetings. <laughs> and these are, they are private things that they don't want people to see. So, but I I've used all this for my jobs uh, and I've shared one recently which is which was on Monday and I've I don't think that can be replicated in full frame like I, I appreciate that you guys give me suggestions and you guys like point me to other options but guys seriously I'm not blind I am a photographer and as a photographer I love all cameras and all lenses I keep myself informed and I educate myself on what's out there my main choice is micro four thirds. I have my reasons. I've just shared them in this stream. I've shared them in a lot of my videos. I don't hide my preferences, although I use micro four thirds, but I am not blind. And I'm not saying that micro four thirds is the best. I always say that if you have an extreme situation, say you need more megapixels, then go to medium format. Or if you are in a situation where you need better high ISO performance, then of course, certain cameras from the full frame cameras will do the job. Micro four thirds just cannot survive in these situations. However, that doesn't mean I don't know what's out there and I haven't done my own comparisons. And like I said, Give me a lens from your people here saying, oh yeah, the APS-C lenses are getting smaller and smaller. Give me one that is this small. Show me. And give me one that is this small. I would love to see. Nothing. Nothing at this small. Maybe an f2.8 lenses, like you said, is small. But f2.8, f1.8. This is f1.7, right? Show me one. 150 millimeters reach with f1.8 aperture. There is this small. Nothing. There's nothing in the market. And these lenses are the ones that I use to get paid, right? So they are very, very, very important to me. Oops, let me just, uh, there's something happened behind. Let me just fix this. 
Be right back. Okay, I am back. Just gotta fix the curtain. Everything is like blowing away. All right. Econ says, Mr. No said, uh, Hello, Robin. I know of some tiny manual lenses that are F like a quarter of the size of those lenses, but the output is bad. Your choices are far better than those due to greater images. Yeah, there are certain like certain standards of image quality that I just need to maintain, right? Tristan Colgate said, People seem to be obsessed with shallow depth of field. F1.8 is F1.8 when it comes to light gathering. That is true. For many years and purposes, actual depth of field, not shallow, was considered a good thing. When I'm doing jobs with my micro filter system, I have not come to, to a situation where depth of field is a problem that I cannot blur my background enough. There are times when my clients actually ask me, hey, can we not have too much blur? Like we need to see the branding in the background. We need to see the, the decorations. Like we spend a lot of money on this background projection. Like we want to see the words or the logo. We want to see the company branding. Like can you not blur off too much? That has come to point. So instead of using f1.8, sometimes I have to stop down to f2.8 or f3.5. So depth of field, depending on what you're doing, like I understand in some situations, uh, especially doing portraits or if you're doing weddings, like people like that dreamy, soft kind of look. They want everything to be blurred into oblivion in the background. I understand that then the shallow depth of field and nice bokeh can be a very good weapon of choice. But uh, I also found that micro four thirds renders enough blur in the background and fun fact you know like my talking head video where i have a very nice blur background because i usually shoot it with the em5 mark 3 and the olympus 45 1.8 this particular lens here this tiny lens here which we've been talking a lot about tonight right i'm using this for my talking head videos and you'll be surprised a lot of people ask me hey robin did you use full frame camera to shoot your talking head video what camera did you use to do your your, your video like, why are you using full frame camera to shoot, like, to talk about micro filters? Then I say, oh no, I'm using Olympus. They'll say, no, impossible. Olympus cannot produce such blur background. <laughs> yeah. Now you know why I like this lens and why nothing can replace this. Ah. <sighs> All right, David Sullivan said, I would love a 10 or 12 f1.4 lenses for micro four thirds, or is it Panasonic 9 f1.7 fast enough for stopping movement in dimly lit situations? David, uh, I'm going to let you in a little bit of trade secret. I talked about this in my last stream, but I've taken the last stream down, so I'm going to repeat it here. While I work for Olympus, there was a plan to, for them to release a 12 millimeters f1.4 lens. And... Uh, I think it was f1.2, 12 f1.2. And they specifically told us, the R&D department said that, the engineers said that um, it is impossible. The lens is just going to be too big, too heavy, and it will not balance with any of the current micro cameras, and it will cost too much. So they, they want to do a little bit of compromise, like making it maybe a 12 f1.4, but in the end, the, the plan was shelved because it is not just not possible to make large aperture uh, prime with wide angle at that time. Now, Panasonic 9 f1.7 is possible because it's f1.7, it's not f1.4. Going down from, uh, from f1.7 to f1.4, f1.2 is actually like, it's like double the size of the opening, right? It's twice as big. And not only that, uh, I remember also that I reviewed the Panasonic 12 f1.4 before and I was shooting that Panasonic 12 f1.4 uh, both on the Panasonic GH4 and also my own EM1 Mark II. And I found a lot of issues with that lens. It's sharp, the bokeh is nice, whatsoever, all the focus is fine, but it has this serious purple haze or purple flare and it's just impossible to correct because the flare just covers the entire screen. And this happens to GH4. So a lot of people argue that, yeah, Panasonic lenses, if you use it on Olympus bodies, because you know, Olympus sensors don't have the UV filter, blah, blah, blah. You get all this purple fringing, blah, 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 blah. That's not true. Panasonic lenses on Panasonic cameras also has this purple haze. And because the haze covers the entire screen, you just can't correct it. You remove the purple, the entire color just shifts. And I, I've reported this uh, on a review 
that I at that time I was writing for Ming Tian, I contributed to his site. It's still out there somewhere. You can just search Robin Wong Panasonic 12 millimeters f1.4 review. It's out there. Uh, so knowing this, that uh, I wouldn't recommend the Panasonic 12 f1.4 to anyone. But uh, the 9 f1.7, however, is a great lens. I I've been using this Panasonic 9, point, uh, 9 f1.7 for my jobs, uh, shooting location shots or tight uh, group photographs. Sorry, group photographs in tight spaces. I've been using this for for my vlogs as well for my second channel i think it's a fantastic lens and i like it it's so small so light uh it has f1.7 bright aperture and nine millimeters is honestly uh, wide enough for all the wide angle shooting that i personally do gordon said uh, we disagree matty may not but that's the fun part i use for fun not work on a bright note what are you using now for this session om5 looks good it's the om1 <laughs> Jacob Brewbaker said Lumix GS85 kit 12 30, 32 and 45 to 150 a good entry point into micro four threads from APS-C looking for portability plus IQ when needed I think it's okay you might want to throw in some prime lenses like this uh, Olympus 45 f1.8 if possible shouldn't cost too much in the used market you can find a good copy or a uh, Panasonic uh, 15 f1.7 or any of the 25 millimeters lenses. Uh, I think that will, because the prime lenses will allow you to do a lot more, right? You can shoot in low light, you can create shallow type of feel, uh, the image quality is better, etc., etc. And you low play for one set, you defended well against all arguments. The issue is that all the arguments I mentioned are used against micro four threads. Well, here's the thing I don't care about these arguments because. I am actually shooting with micro four thirds and the micro four thirds give me results. At the end of the day, is that not all that matters? The photographs that you shoot? Is it, you have to ask yourself, number one, is it good enough for the clients? Are the clients complaining or are they happy with the photographs? Number two, are you happy with the photographs? If the clients are happy, I get paid. End of story. If I'm happy with the photographs, why bother with all these arguments? <laughs> Vic Roman said, uh, G9 Mark II, but in a smaller body, body of a GX9 maybe, that's what I want. Yeah, I think Panasonic will definitely continue with their GX series camera bodies. Uh, just give them some time to sort things out. They just launched the G9 Mark II, so it'll be maybe a few months or maybe one year later until they launch the GX9. So give them some time and hopefully all the goodness from the G9 Mark II will be trickled down to the GS line body. David Cruz said, don't forget the like button. Thank you so much, David. I really, really appreciate that. Since Tad uh, Music said, even the 25 f1.2 is easy to handle compared to similar in full frame. That is true because of the smaller size, right? And the 25 f1.2 has some really nice feathered bokeh. Amazing. Luke Parsons said, hi from Perth. Hey, Luke, what's up? I think it's quite late in Perth already, right? Man. Gunter Martin Schiss said, uh, I find market photo is more than good enough. What I really miss in most modern cameras is the feeling and experience shooting with them. That's why I always grab my ancient Leica M8 when I leave the house. Yeah, Leica has this thing about them that when you look at the camera, you just want to pick them up and it just feels right. I don't know how to explain it, right? I know that in terms of technicality, it makes no sense. Like, you know, it's not, it doesn't have autofocus, the rangefinder series cameras, you know, like the images are nothing to shout about and the lenses are like crazy, stupid, expensive. You can buy like cars with them, right? If you own like three, four lenses, you can even buy a house <laughs> here in Malaysia with the prices that you spend, the money you spend on buying those Leica lenses. Uh, but, the, but the point is, is like, I think it's the experience, right? Like these are classic camera makers. They are still handcrafted by the German experts and there's just something in the camera that just, I don't know, there's, there's, there's that, that excitement when you use those Leica M series cameras. Angelo Play for one said, why are there no fast many wide angle lenses? Yeah, it's not easy to make them, I guess. Uh, I just talked about it a little bit earlier if you have, if you have uh, not missed it. Uh, Olympus tried like making a 10 f1, I think 12 millimeters f1.2. And this this was like maybe seven years ago, when, when seven or eight years ago when I heard this from the engineers. They just said that it's just impossible. It's just gonna be too big and too expensive, right? Yeah. John Yazi said, uh, oh, he's talking to Jacob. I have the, that kit and I like it a lot. Only issue for me is EVF because I wear glasses, but I've adapted to it. David Cruz said, I like my Olympus fish eye body cap lens, 9F8, and uh, there's no reason not to carry it. I know, right? Hey, David, um, 
I don't know if you've checked this out. Maybe you've seen some reviews out there, but I will publish. I've made one content about this lens, but I'll probably make another one about this. This is the uh, 7 Artisans 18mm f6.3. I know it's very different from the Olympus uh, body cap lens, but a few things to note. The Olympus body cap lens is all plastic. This is all metal. And you remember like the Olympus body cap lens, there is this lever here that is very hard for you to use to manual focus. Whereas here, you have full manual focusing ring. <laughs> it's all metal, it has full manual focusing ring, and, and it has like 18 millimeters, which is equivalent to 36. That's very close to the 35 uh, classic street photography lens. And the image quality is not bad. It's really not bad, this lens. I, I highly recommend this lens. I'm going to talk about it in, in one of my coming videos. Sunny Ng said, Hey there from Singapore. Hey Sunny, how are you? Just wondering if there is a chance to hang out and do some shutter therapy with fellow micro photographers in Singapore. I'm sure you can, right? Uh, I don't know if there's any other guys uh, from Singapore live now. Maybe you guys can uh, hook up with each other and go out, have coffee and do some photo walks. That'll be so fun. Hey Brian, how are you? Brian uh, from that micro photographers guy has an awesome awesome youtube channel let me just pull up his youtube channel you guys please subscribe to brian uh just now we were talking about micro four threads content creator uh, let me see he should be in my subscription feed somewhere i have so much subscribe uh, channels all right found him all right i'm gonna paste brian's uh youtube channel here okay this is uh, that micro four thirds guy, uh, Brian James. He has amazing, amazing videos and content on micro four thirds. Please check him out. I do value his opinion. Uh, please go and give him a subscribe and say hi. <laughs> All right, coming back to, to Brian's comment. Micro four thirds gives me more than enough depth of field for me to do any of my portrait work. That is true. Like when I'm shooting with um, this 45 FMA, there's plenty of blur background to work with. And if you go to this 75 F1.8, sometimes I even stop down to F2.8 uh to get more depth of field usually it's too shallow even on the f1.8 25 45 yeah just exactly what i said right eyes will be in focus nose and ear will be yes exactly like I, I i don't get this obsession of like why people are shooting with crazy fast lenses like recently i borrowed a nikon f uh, 50 f1.4 is the d version and old version to to try on my nikon d600 full frame right and uh, i had i have the nikon 50 f1.8 which i swapped with a lens i saw like my friend jackie he has a 50 f1.4 I said, hey jackie let's swap lenses for the weekend i want to try your 50 f1.4 and as i was shooting with the 50 f1.4 as i was doing my usual close-up portraits like oh my goodness shooting at the eye not even all the lashes aren't in focus. And of course, the nose will be in focus and everything else. Is, is, the nose will be out of focus. The ear, everything will be like blur. It's, it's so weird looking at the face when it's like this one part of the eye in focus. It's like in, in parts of the face, it's like not in focus. It's just weird. And I have to sh stop down to like F2 to get like okay sh shot or step back a little bit to, to shoot then I crop in. It's just weird and, and it doesn't work. Like I understand that oh people say yeah but you can stop down and still achieve the same thing. It's not the same. <laughs> I can give you a scenario right. Like for example I do my insect macro photography and generally with my um, uh, micro photo threads setup I'll shoot with f8 to, to f13 to get sufficient depth of field because when you shoot insects really close up you don't just want to see the eye in focus right you want to see the antenna you want to see the fangs you want to see the legs the body the wings right you want to see details in the body the fur and everything right that's what makes it great you want to see really all the details and even f8 to f13 i can't get the whole body in focus imagine if i were to use a full frame camera are you asking me to use f20 f26 <laughs> I uh, seriously? And you say, yeah, you can get similar thing by stopping the like what? Are you really? Okay, okay, I guess you guys will just have to use F30 then. Alright, uh Polio said, what is your recommendation for shooting just JPEG? All I want is more details in shadows and save as much highlights as possible. You can play around. Um, I'm assuming you're using Olympus OMD camera. 
you can play around with the highlight and shadow feature. Uh, you can tone up the highlight, boost up the shadow. And you can also play with the gradation setting. You can set it to auto. That will greatly help in boosting the shadow details. All right, I have a super chat. I don't know if I can highlight this. Kares, thank you so much for the super chat. I uh, really appreciate it. The comment says, still going strong, I see. Keep up the great work, Robin. Thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, and also, I want to give a shout out to anyone who has contributed to me directly, either in my PayPal or you bought me a coffee on the Buy Me A Coffee site. Thank you so much. All this contribution really helped me to create better content, uh, to make better quality videos. Like for example, like this microphone. I'm exper experimenting with a new setup. Now I've bought this dead cat or the windshield to put on top of the microphone. And uh, I don't even know if this works, but this costs money, right? Although it's not a lot, this is like about $10 or something. And of course, like this like new lighting at the back. I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, yeah, all these things cost money. And I've also had a pop filter before and all these things and all these uh, contributions from you guys, big and small, they help me greatly and just continue to inspire me to make more content for you guys. And after all, without you guys, there's no Robin Wong. So thank you so much for being here and thank you so much, Carl S. I really appreciate that. All right, getting back to the other comments. Gordon said, uh, whatever happened to Robin in the city? Enjoyed that short clip, but can't seem to find it anymore. Ah, oh, thank you so much. I, I made the video... In very early on, uh, there were a few mistakes that I did. So I'm gonna let's let's talk about it. So the first mistake that I did was uh, I used a cheap ND filter, like really cheap variable ND filter. And when you really look at the video, the it's too soft. It, it doesn't look look like a 4K video. And I of course I was on a budget. Like I said, I don't spend a lot of money on gear. So I thought like, I can get away with a cheap filter. It took me. A, a while to realize that the filter was really, really, really bad and it affected my video quality because I wasn't editing on a high resolution screen. I was editing on a full HD screen. Another mistake which I upgraded my, my uh, monitor or computer screen to a high resolution one um, a little bit later when I realized the mistake. So two mistakes that I did. Uh, so the video didn't look really good and the, because the filter is cheap, it also sort of like changed the color profile of the video a little bit. It was a little bit greenish, bluish. It looks, it doesn't look really good. Uh, in short, I wasn't happy, not so much of the video that I did, but it's just that it is not representative of the EM5 Mark III's video capability. I hope that makes sense. Because the reason I make the video is so that I can talk about my video shooting experience with the EM5 Mark III, because as a non-videographer, and yet I still want to experiment with video, I thought that it was a great camera, right? For a new newcomer or a beginner. If you are experienced, of course, you want to use manual focus, you want to use like more expensive uh, cinematography cameras, cinema cameras, right? But as a content creator, as a photographer first, and I'm just making YouTube videos to share my passion about uh, photography, I thought that, uh, you know, using the EM5 Mark III is a great video tool. So that's why I made uh, Robin in the City short video. And it was, it was really fun. I had a lot of fun making that. But uh, looking back now, the quality is not really representative. It's not fair for the EM5 Mark Mark III, so that's why I took it down. I hope that answers the question, Gordon. Kenyon said, hi, uh, Robin, hi. I have the EM1 Mark II looking at a second budget-friendly use camera for hybrid use, decent video, or the focus. Uh, has the EM1 Mark II aged well, or should I look for a Mark III or better? I think you can get another EM1 Mark II as a second camera, or you can get the EM5 Mark III. I think EM5 Mark III makes a great second camera because it's smaller. So in situations where you need something smaller to bring around, you can bring that with one or two small prime lenses. It gets the job done. Like when I go out to do my video, I only bring two lenses. The, yeah, so EM5 Mark III and these two lenses. Let me just find the lenses. Ha, the two lenses that I use to make my, my YouTube videos. Again, you cannot find this in any Appy SC setup, whatever. These two lenses, the, uh, I don't know, you can see this in focus because my face is getting in the way. 45 and the 15, 1.7, Panasonic 15, 1.7, which is a great lens. And of course, Olympus 45, 1.8 for all my talking head shots. I use these two lenses for everything to make my YouTube videos. So a couple with a small body, it makes a great, great combo. Let me just put, mount this back on the camera so that the, the sensor is not exposed. 
Luke Parsons said, The size and look of cameras is important to enthusiasts. My teenage kids won't be seen in public with me if I have my Canon 5D Mark III. But my G9 Lumix is acceptable. My, do my daughter loves her Fujifilm X10. Oh, that Fuji X10 is such a great camera. Hey! Oh, I would love to get one in and play. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think look is important. It's not just for enthusiasts. I think for professionals, uh, the clients will appreciate something that looks like a DSLR, something with a hump, uh, with a large grip and black. I think it's just an unspoken rule that if you're a pro photographer, you should use a DSLR. If you don't have a DSLR, then your camera should look like a DSLR. It's just... It's just psychological, right? It doesn't mean anything. But yeah, I, I get what you mean. Look is important. Right, let's... Uh, I'm just gonna grab a quick drink. Getting a little bit thirsty. How are you guys doing so far? There's still like 113 of you here. That's crazy. We are like... We are almost three hours into the stream. <laughs> I've been online for almost three hours answering questions after questions after questions. Man! Ah, but I'm having so much fun. And guys, thank you so much for being here. After my water, there I want my, my coffee. I see I have like a few drops of coffee left. Oh my goodness. All right. Uh, Jacob Brewbaker said, uh, thanks. Oh, it's talking to John Yatzi. You guys keep having conversations with each other. No worries. Jaraj said hi from Qatar. Hi Jaraj, how are you? Thanks for dropping by. Car S said I missed the event. What event? Uh, sorry, I, I can't recall what event we were talking about. Uh, Nitro Kramium said, hey Robin, what's the lightest camera lens combo for vacation or just walking around? I'd like to put together something cheap and effective. The current new cameras that I can suggest, like if you want a like really, really, really compact setup, is either the Olympus Pan EPL series, it can be EPL 9, EPL 10, oh, no worries, you don't have to get the latest, or the Panasonic GF series, the GF 9 or the GF 10. And you can start with a uh, pancake lens, like this one. This is the GM1 with the 12 to 32 pancake lens. It's a very tiny combo. Let me just bring it here a little bit so you can see it a little bit brighter. Small lens, small camera setup, and you still have a micro four thirds sensor in it with all the goodness of micro four thirds. You can change lens and swap to other micro four thirds lens if you want. I thought this is still a very capable camera, if you ask me. I brought this back to Kuching. I did a video with this uh, camera for, I brought this camera for casual shoots. I took photographs of my friends, food, places. It's basically a travel photograph, uh, vacation, like what you wanted to do. I have a video, like maybe it's like three or four videos back. Do check it out. Brian said, you're too kind, Robin. Thank you. I'm still playing catch up to your amazing. Ah, don't, don't worry about it. I, I, tend to make a lot of videos talking a lot. Sometimes when I look at my videos, like, hmm, yeah, maybe I should not talk so much. <laughs> but but thank, thank you so much. You, you are too kind. Yeah, Rebirth 25, 26 set, uh, Olympus 9 body cap lens. Is it worth getting one? Uh, a few things you have to keep in mind. The 9mm body cap lens is a fish eye lens, so it does have a lot of barrel distortion. Are you okay with the barrel distortion? That's number one. Number two, it is a manual focusing lens. So are you okay with manual focus all the time? Uh, if you're okay with that, then it's, it's okay. Then go for it. It's super wide. So you got to bear in mind that you're actually using an almost like a fish eye lens kind of experience. Not many people are okay with the fish eye lens. A lot of people think they are until they shoot more with the lens and they realize that they don't like the distortion, they don't like the look. So make sure you're okay with the look first. Look at sample photographs. There are so many sample photographs online now uh, taken with that lens. So take a close look at the, um, the, the distortion, how it affects the photograph. Are you okay with that distortion in your image? Jenshin Coffee House said, I use micro four thirds for all my advertising and marketing material. It works great because it's very mobile and set up in different locations. I love the tone of photographs. I know, right? That's the, the main key point of what micro four thirds philosophy is. It is small, it is light, it is portable, you can move. That's the thing. Like, I, I don't want to be stuck in one location with like a huge lens and a huge camera with a monopod or a tripod. Like, I just want to keep moving and getting different shots. And like, I, I don't want my camera and lens to slow me down. That's thanks for sharing that, Zhenshin. 
David Cruz said, RAW will always give you the best quality image. That is true. Uh, if you can shoot RAW, of course, RAW will, will be the preferred option. But, but David, like, I have also encountered many situations where I need to deliver my JPEG photographs. For example, a product launch event. Uh, after the shoot, the client will debug the image immediately. Like I don't even have time to transfer the photographs and look at my photographs. So what I do is, uh, because my cameras have dual cut slots, so I assign one cut slot for RAW and the other one for JPEG, I'll just give them the JPEG card and they'll immediately select the photographs and upload to social media and give it to the press or media for to so that they can write the stories and publish them on the same day. And at this, this kind of situations, you just have to shoot JPEG and you just have to make sure that your JPEG settings or what you're doing is on point. Like you cannot severely underexpose or overexpose your shot and hope to correct it later in post, right? Or you just don't care about the white balance, you can fix it in post later, right? No, you got to get things right because your photographs are going to be used immediately. There's no delay. You don't have time to edit your photographs. Gordon said, uh, what I quite enjoy, the micro four thirds guy, is he often uses his G100 for video and a kit lens. It always looks so good. For go to, thanks for doing this. Yes. Yeah, I do admire Brian from the micro four thirds guy. Yeah. Josh said, a couple DXO for software, my EM12 rocks, even at super high ISO. Jet Set Journey said, sounds great, Robin. Thanks. Thanks for that. Shajin Nambir said, uh, EM1 Mark II or Mark III body for macro. They are the same. No difference. Santix said, Olympus Digital and D-Filter, hope that can be incorporated for video use. No, if you understand how the live ND works, it doesn't work for video. So the live ND is just another computational photography or trick uh, using multiple shots and stack them together. So like, okay, we don't talk about N digital ND first, we talk about high-res shot. High-res shot takes like uh, eight photographs, or 16 photographs depending on tripod or handheld shot and then they merge the photographs together for the high resolution. Uh, HDR shot, there's a HDR mode, you take like four photographs, you merge them together to expand the dynamic range. Live composite mode, you take multiple photographs and then the images just continue to go on and then the brighter area will be blended into the image additively. So it's like many, many photographs blended into one. Live ND, live ND, basically they call it the neutral density filter, is also taking multiple shots and blend it together. If you understand how this works, so the camera takes like four shots at a low exposure so that it to prevent under exposure and merge it together to simulate the motion, right? If you understand how this works, how the hell can this be implemented in video? Like, if you know how this works, it takes many photographs to merge into one. Video is like, you need to continuously, like in one second you take, if you're shooting a 24p video, right? Or, uh, yeah. Then you need to take 24 photographs in that one second. How? It doesn't work. <laughs> you, I, do you get what I mean? Like, if you know the mechanics of what the digital ND is, it just doesn't work for video. Like, seriously, it just, it just doesn't. Uh, Brian says, the comment about the look is true. If I don't want to look like a pro, I'll use my GS8. If I want to look pro, I'll use my EM1 or G9. Of course, I'm taking the same photos. That is true. Yeah, I wouldn't want to show up in a wedding uh, venue doing a job shooting with this camera, right? Nobody will take me seriously. They'll think like, I'm just one of the guests. That is true. Like, get a camera that looks the part. Abdul Rahim said, uh, by the way, one bad thing in Micro Four Thirds, you cannot find a good coffee lens in Micro Four Thirds. <laughs> Too small, right? You need like a bigger, bigger lens like this Canon L bulky, super huge lens to, to put enough coffee in the cup. Yeah. Ah. Number six, like more now. <laughs> Thank you so much. My goodness. It's almost two hours and there's more than 100 of you here. That is scary. Man, Jaraj, uh, you guys are talking to each other. No worries. Kevin Mart said, last wedding I shot, I put away my full frame Sony's at the end of the night and mingled on the dance floor with the original EM1, 17 f1.8 and off camera flash and got some great action shots. I know, right? Even the EM1 has some really fast autofocus and the image quality is not too shabby either if you know what you're doing. Santix said, uh, if Olympus 70 f1.8 compared to 21.7, if the autofocus is much better in low light, yes, the 70 f1.8 autofocus is way faster than the 20 f1.7. Uh, 
Number six asks, Robin, how is the skin tone on the GM1 and how do you fix it? It's terrible. No matter what I do, it still looks terrible. I think all my GM1 shots that I shared on my YouTube or anyway, it just looks horrible. Uh, Santik said, what is your straight out of camera JPEG settings that you use? Please share. I have an... Um, you mean the, the curves? No, I don't change the highlight and shadow at all. That's not why I touch. If you want to improve the dynamic range, or if you care about preserving highlights or you want to boost the shadows, then you go and play. And it, it depends on situations, like maybe some situations you minus five, some situations you plus two, it's different. You have to adjust on the go. But uh, my straight of a camera JPEG set settings I've shared, uh, you can type Robin Wong cheat sheet. You should see it somewhere. Basically, Large, super fine. Uh, profile is natural. Sharpness, saturation, contrast, zero. Noise filter, off or low. And basically, that's it. And white balance, keep color, warm color, off. Auto white balance most of the time, unless it's tricky, then I use custom white balance. I mean, the ones you share to clients right after shoot, yeah. That's why I said exactly the same. Uh, the list is actually in... You just search Robin Wong cheat sheet somewhere. <laughs> Brian says, Canon lenses is for latte coffees. Micro Potter's lenses is for espresso shots. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. Sandy said, Vivian Natural. Natural all the way. Jairaj said, Robin, you are one among the sweet gentle genius camera guy I met over the net. Hats off to you. Thank you so much. I also believe that being genuine is important, hey, because it shows, it not, not only shows through how you talk or what you're talking about, but it also shows through your photography work. Like, I want to talk a little bit about this. Your photography is about you because you are the one making your photographs, right? And whether you like it or not, part of you will be incorporated or will be shown in your photography work. So if you are not genuine, if you're trying to be someone else or if you are doing something that is not representing who you are or your true self, right? It will show in your phot photography as well. Your photography is like an extension of you, right? So always try to be honest, always try to be truthful to yourself. Then your photography will speak about that and people can see that, can recognize it through your photography work. Yeah, not many people talk about this. Yes, keep warm color off, correct. Brian says, got to go, Robin. As always, a highly entertaining, informative session. Be well and happy. Best wishes. Same to you, Brian. Take care, and I'll see you in your next video. <laughs> Santi says, thanks for the inf information. No worries. I'm glad I can share. I will stay on for maybe another 10, 15 minutes because it's approaching midnight here in Malaysia, but... Hey, I'm having so much fun talking to you guys and as long as you guys are here and based on my statistics, there's still like 107 of you here. That is insane. <laughs> wow, there's a lot of people watching this. I think this is the most, uh, this is possibly the stream with the most viewers up to date and thank you so, 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 so much. Mm. Exploring with Rotten Fish said, I'm the lucky one, meet you at the train station with Matis Solanto. Oh, hello, hi. Thanks for dropping by. <laughs> you know what, that morning, uh, I was meeting Matis Solanto for a photo walk, right? Or I think we were possibly going to make a video together. And yeah, you, you came up and we were talking together and he just showed up because I was waiting for him and just showed up. And then after that, we went on and make the video happen for that day. He called us at the right time. Thanks, thanks for coming up and say hi. It made, it made our day. I think Mati was surprised to see anyone recognizing him in Malaysia. Rainbow number five said, I have Lawa 6 F2 waiting in post office. I can't decide if I go get it or not. I love wide angles, but it's more expensive than any other lenses I've bought before. Uh, Lawa lenses, good quality. I have a video review for the Lawa 6 F2. Uh, please check it out if you have not done so. Just go to, just search Robin Wong Lawa F2, uh, 6mm F2. I think this is the only lens that is this wide for micro four thirds. This is the widest lens. It gives the equivalent of 12mm. 
And because it's so wide, it may be a little bit hard to use in some situations, like you may accidentally include your feet in your composition, or you might include certain people or things that you don't want in your shot. That's the only challenge. But uh, I think lower lenses are generally quite good in terms of sharpness, in terms of optical flow control, uh, no issue whatsoever. They are quite the reputation is actually very 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 good i have no issue with the lens uh it does have some flaws but nothing extraordinary or no deal breakers whatsoever i thought that if you need that wide because i don't see a need for it but i can understand some people will need like to do astrophotography or some people want to do interior architecture or building shots like they need as, as much width as possible or they're shooting in a really tight space they want to cover as much as possible in the frame then this is a great lens i don't think you'll regret it i think you enjoyed it Hernan Otto said, of course, microfilters is enough. What's wrong with people who claims opposite? I have more than 12 years work with microfilters. Wedding, corporate, industry, and a lot of entrepreneurs printing high-res shots. I know, right? I, I don't think I've shot industrial or entrepreneurs, but I've done weddings, corporates. I've done products. I've done uh, portraits, lots of portraits and events. I've done a lot of events as well. And I've, I don't do a lot of prints, but every time I do weddings, especially pre-wedding portraits, I print photo books, large books, and uh, my clients are always very happy. I've printed two books this year. I don't do weddings so much anymore, but I've printed two photo books this year. And if you have uh, explored around in my second vlog channel, my second YouTube channel, the vlog one, I have shared some of those prints, like in the video. <laughs> Go look around. Hernan also said on canvas, delivery 90% on screen. I before GH5, G9 today with two GH6, more than enough. The cash box ring, ring more. Yeah, that's true. In two days, have a wedding here in Mexico. So well payment in advance. Well, all the best for your shoot. And I'm glad to hear another micro for thirds shooter doing serious photography work. And I'm sure you're going to do well. I'm sure your clients will love your work. Thanks for sharing, Hernan. This side to a screen. Hi, from Boston. Hey, thanks for dropping by. Always nice to see you here. Jarash said, we'll visit Malaysia one day and we'll meet you. Yes, please come and drop me an email. We can have a coffee or something. Santi said, what about RAW? Do you still process them since client already wanted to and taken the JPEGs? So the JPEGs are for immediate release. For, they are for press release sometimes. Either they maybe want to put up on their website. They want to share an Instagram story. Uh, immediate use, right? I will always process my photographs from RAW and deliver to my clients later. If it's less than 100 photos, I'll just process immediately. Sometimes I deliver on the same day or the day after. If it's a wedding, of course, I come home with like 5,000 shots. Then I'll take like maybe one to two weeks to deliver. If it's a larger job, so say in a full day event or a full day festival, which I just did a uh, two days festival, the Yasan Saim Darby Arts Festival, then I'll, I'll actually, it took me, I, I told the client I'll deliver it to them in two weeks, but it took me one week to complete my photographs. And I also have to wait for my other, uh, my teammates, my, my shooters, my photographers uh, to deliver their part of photographs and I deliver them in one week. Joe Pritz said, Robin, you're drinking coffee at midnight. Yes, coffee is life. Coffee is everything. And one tip, one coffee a day will make you a better photographer. You hear it from me first. <laughs> Santi said, then for those shoots uh, where you shoot raw and did them, how is your raw processing flow in general? I do very minimal post-processing. I edit my photographs in Capture One Pro. Uh, most of the time, <laughs> I'll straighten my photographs first because as I shoot on the go, sometimes I'm capturing moments. I just have to click. I don't have time to level my photographs. So there's always some leveling that, that needs to be done. And after the level, I need to like crop in a little bit to balance things. That's the first thing. Then uh, exposure, if it's a little bit underexposed or overexposed, I just balance it and recover some uh, uh, details in the highlight and shadow. Most of my photographs shot in daylight has no issues with white balance or colors, so I leave the colors, I don't touch them. But usually if I'm shooting stage photography using LED lights, all these ugly lights, like sometimes there's like purple, green, whatever, then I'll tweak the white balance to adjust for a more natural, pleasing skin tone. Uh, pretty much that's it. I don't, no sharpening. I live, actually there is sharpening, that's not true. The software already has a default sharpening applied to the raw file. So like the sharpening, the noise reduction, everything I leave it on the default settings on the software. 
And basically that's it. The goal of the post-processing is to make the photograph look a little bit more natural and looks a little bit more polished. I don't do extensive uh, photographs. I know some of my friends, the after edit photograph and the before photograph, you put it side by side, they look like completely different. I don't do that. Launch Sha Finista said, greetings from the Canary Islands in Spain. Hey, how are you? Thanks for dropping by. Glad to see you here. This side of screen said, currently I don't own a full frame, been using APS-C and Micro Four Thirds. I've enjoyed the two formats for many different subject matters. I've never had anyone say it is not good enough. That is true. That is true. As long as you are happy with the photographs and if you're shooting for a client and the client is happy, that's all that matters, right? What, what more do you want? Olivier Garden said, Robin, is it possible to find buy your coffee cup somewhere? I will need a full frame size for my tea. <laughs> I bought this from um, an online shopping platform in Malaysia. It's called Lazada. Uh, it's like an equivalent of Amazon. It's like, you know, if you guys have Amazon in US or Europe, we don't have Amazon here yet. I heard that Amazon is coming to Malaysia. But uh, yeah, it's an equivalent site. So I guess like maybe you go to Amazon or some of these online sites in your country and just type uh, Canon Lens Coffee Mug or something. <laughs> HR Munro said, on, my, on an Olympus photo walk several years ago, the Pan Am was new, tried the 714 Pro, but couldn't keep my feet out of the shot. Shot it mainly at 12 to 14, then swapped it for the 75 f1.8, which I loved. That's the thing, when you use an ultra wide angle lens, it gets a little bit more tricky because you fit in a lot more than necessary. So you gotta be very, very careful with your composition. And especially six is a lot wider than seven. You think that, oh, it's just one millimeters, but that one millimeter in the ultra wide angle wool is a lot. So fitting so much in your frame, like depends on what you do. If you're doing street photography, it might be counterproductive. You might be better getting away with a 14 millimeters or 15 millimeters lens. It's already so wide. I think uh, six is just too wide. And then 714 is an ultra wide angle for specific use purpose. Tommy Boylan said, my client's thing is good enough, so, and that's all that matters. That is true. That's all that matters, right? Hernan Otto said, with the new GH6, the JPEG is really great. Not that enough for social media. Uh, more than enough for social media, sorry. Roy is, or high res for pay jobs. I sent you a cup of coffee. Oh, thank you so much, Hernan. Thank you for that. Uh, any contribution from you guys, if you're buying me a cup of coffee or if you send direct contribution to my PayPal, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, they keep me going. And as you know, making content, it costs money. If I would go to the zoo, I have to pay entrance fee and the transport to get there. And there's just so much more cost that people don't see. And then I also spend a lot of time making this video. And I'm taking my own time out to make these videos. And each video will actually take one to two days to produce and make, right? Like uh, I need to sit down, do my research, draft the script that will take like half an hour. Then I go out to shoot. Uh, the talking head video will take maybe three hours. And then if it's a review of a camera lens, I need to spend more time, a few more days to shoot sample photographs because I always believe that if I don't have enough sample photographs, then I cannot talk about that product at all. So factor that in and plus the editing of the video, which will take another two to three hours, all in all to publish on the YouTube. It's just one to two full days of actual shooting and editing and people don't see that i'm taking my own time so any contribution from you guys so Hernan, thank you so much for the coffee thank you so much i really really appreciate it it really keeps me going because hey i enjoy doing this for you guys and if you find it useful your support is really appreciated Santik said, gotcha, edit raw to try to get true to life exposure. Yeah, after all, photography should be a representation of real life. Well, that depends on what kind of photography that you do. I know that some people, they, they want to edit like the photographs to look like it's a fantasy. If that's what you want to do, then go ahead. But for me, like my clients will appreciate like skin looking like skin. And you know, if it's a red dress, look at red. So everything looks real. That's the kind of photography that I do. Lon Chafinista said, I'm a Fujifilm fan. I have an SD20, but I'm interested in the new Panasonic G9 Mark II. They are both very different cameras. Hey, I think the SD20 is targeted towards a more compact sized uh, camera. And it's not a pro level camera, whereas the G9 Mark II is a pro level camera with like really beefy video specifications. Santi said, the 45 f one can be a nice tea cup. I think more like an espresso shot uh, cup. <laughs> it's so, so tiny. Right. 
Lumiere Obscure said, Hey again, Robin. Uh, did you ever try using any AI denoising software like DSO Lab? I tried on high ISO APS-C shots and gave me spectacular clean images. No. Uh, well, the reason is, I don't want to get rid of the noise. I thought, first of all, the noise are not destructive to the image. The noise is present. And secondly, I thought that the noise adds structure to the image. And I don't like my images to be clinically clean, like completely washed out of details. And I don't like that look. So my clients never complain so far. If they start complaining, maybe I'll start using full frame cameras or explore this denoising software. So, so far, like, uh, take a look at my recent video, the one that I did on Monday, the one that I've just posted a few days ago. I shot ISO 12800 in some of the shots. Uh, take a look at the shots. See what you think. Do you think they need any denoising? <laughs> wow. S Creation TG. SR Creation TG said, Hi sir, how are you? Can tell me a Canon ROS 10 live streaming or not in mirrorless cameras? Trying to make sense of what you're trying to ask me. Can you tell me Canon EOS 10? R10, right? Is it a Canon R10? So I'm asking that R10 can do a live streaming or not. I don't know. I think R10 is one of the latest, cheapest uh, R mount, RF R mount cameras from a uh, mirrorless camera from Canon. Uh, if it has a HDMI out, now of course you can use uh, for live streaming. Just make sure you find if it has an HDMI out. Then you just uh, put in a. Uh, capture card or uh, a video card, HDMI card, uh, then you can plug it into your computer and you can do live streaming. YT Duffy said, uh, you guys are talking to each other, no worries. And Santi said, 75 f1.8 can be a nice Japanese green team mark. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, it is past midnight already, and I've been online for more than uh, two hours. Uh, three hours, actually, three hours. I will I'll read a few more comments, and I'll call it a day, because I just saw a few, few comments coming in. Rock Music said, thanks for your content, and you are one of the reasons I switched to Micro Four Thirds. Thanks for letting me know, Rob. I know you don't specialize in landscape, but there is is there a reason for the 200 f4 would not make a good landscape lens? Thanks. I guess maybe it's not wide enough at 12, uh, because most of landscape landscape shooters would shoot with like a 714 or anything with ultra wide angle. Yep, that's the only reason that I can think of. Lon Chafinista said, I have doubts whether to buy the Olympus OM-1 or the Panasonic G9 Mark II. The difference is $200 for the body only. Yeah, it's hard for me to give you the suggestion now because I don't have the G9 Mark II and I have not seen it in person. Whatever information that I have is available online, like all the other YouTubers, other photographers, they share the comparison. So what you know and what I know, there are no differences. And I, I can't give you a personal recommendation or personal opinion unless I have my hands on the G9 Mark II. James Nodick said, the new denoise function in Lightroom is really good. I have heard as well. Lon Chafinista said, the new artificial intelligence technologies can reduce noise by two steps. Yeah, but the point of that video that I made two days ago is that you should not obsess over noise. M uh, moments matter more than noise. It is not the noise that makes a bad photograph. It is the missed moment. <laughs> I think it's something that a lot of people fail to realize. It's just they see the noise in the photograph, they think it's a bad photograph. No. Even if you have noise in the photograph, if it's a good photograph, it is a good photograph. If it is totally clean with no noise, it can still be a bad photograph. Think about that. This side to a screen say, thanks Robin, these live streams are great. I will stop. Uh, unscreen questions here thank you so much guys for tuning in we still have about 100 people live that is insane that's crazy thank you so much for tuning in i appreciate you being here and uh, it has made this live stream so lively and i really enjoy answering your questions and there are some really nice questions here as well i hope you have enjoyed uh 
chatting with me here you've enjoyed the conversations just a quick recap of what i've talked about the main topic is micro four thirds good enough i think micro four thirds is very important for the camera industry because they were the first to push the mirrorless system they were the first to show the world what the mirrorless system is capable of both olympus and panasonic they have done wonders. They have proven that Micro Four Thirds is a capable camera. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Hernan02, uh, uh, for the super chat. Uh, thank you, thank you. Why can't I highlight it? Yes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, coming back to the summary, I also think that uh, Micro Four Thirds have been sufficient for my job. Uh, I have been doing all my professional shoots with Micro Four Thirds for the past 7-8 years, no issue whatsoever. And I've found that I've never had issues with dynamic range or high eyes, or I've made a video to talk about that in the recent video. Uh, just published on Monday, that I've shot ISO 2800, no issue. And at the end of the day, it is whether your clients are happy with your photographs. My clients never complained. They kept coming back to me. I get my bills paid. If they're happy, end of story. The second part is, are you happy with your photographs? If you are, then what's the issue? Why listen to everyone else, right? So for me, it's enough, but I can't speak for you. I also acknowledge that there are situations where micro photos will fail, like when your clients need high resolution, you know, currently we are stuck at 20, 25 megapixels. In some situations, that may not be enough. And of course, there are situations where there's extreme low light, and of course, that's where full frame will come in with uh, better high ISO handling. Now, other than that, for all other situations, I don't shoot at the beach under moonlight. I don't need to shoot 100 megapixels. My clients are happy with 20 megapixels. So, Micro Four Thirds for me is more than enough at this moment. I don't see a reason to upgrade and it has given me a lot of uh, great photographs I delivered to my clients and I appreciate that the cameras and lenses are really tiny, especially like 45, 1.8 is really, 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 really tiny. And some of you argue that, oh yeah, we can get like similar size in APS-C, like really? 40, where? Which 45, 1.8 in, in, in in um, APS-C sized and this 150 millimeters reach f1.8 like seriously like you have this small lens with APS-C I have not seen it so in terms of cost performance I think micro four thirds is still relevant today I'm very happy using it I can't speak for everyone but I definitely think it's good enough now thank you for tuning in if you found my sharing beneficial if you've enjoyed this live stream if you've enjoyed any of my videos please consider buying me a cup of coffee or you can contribute directly to my PayPal links in the description of the video any small contribution goes a long way, will definitely help me to continue making more photographs, making more content and publish them right here. I will be publishing a lot more new videos very, very soon and also do more live streams, hopefully in the next one or two weeks. And I'll see you guys again at the next one. Please take care and please go out and take more photographs. Bye-bye.